We begin day two with the Rutgers Scarlet Knights entering the fourth season under head coach Kalen Schweighoffer, returning nine players from last season, but it is a very young roster, a roster that did a terrific job in terms of defensively with blocks last season, 49 solo blocks, third highest mark the program has posted since 2008. And we are excited to welcome head coach Caitlin Schweighoffer into the studio. Coach, first and foremost, thanks for being with us. I know this experience has kind of just started for you and for your players, but as you start to look ahead to the 2023 season, what's the most exciting part of that for a coach? Well, thank you for having me. It's, it's an honor to be here. And I think it's, it's really fun to, of course, return the players that we have, add new players to the roster. But the youth makes it exciting because there's a lot of unknown about this year. And I think that we've done so many things in the offseason and over the summer to physically, mentally prepare this team for um, a challenging conference slate. But it's a matter of, you know, I think that there's going to be some surprises. And I think that we're right on the cusp of something really great. And it's a, it's a fun group to coach. I enjoy all of them. And I'm just excited to see what they can do. You do have one of the youngest rosters, not just in the Big Ten, but one of the youngest rosters that you'll see in the country this year. And that's really highlighted by today. You bring two student athletes, one a redshirt sophomore, one a true sophomore. You're the only school involved here in Big Ten Volleyball Media Days that doesn't have an official upperclassman with you. What does that mean in terms of the job for you and your staff to get this team chemistry-wise where it needs to be before opening night? Very important. When I took over this position, you know, this will be my fourth season at Rutgers, I, I had a lot to, to turn over, and we were really looking to build this program into a powerhouse in the Big Ten. And for me, my philosophy, it really starts with recruiting, and it starts with bringing in you know, class after class after class and build upon them. And my 22 class was really my first kind of real recruiting class. 23 was one that we were actually out to, able to go and see live, <laughs> play live, not just on video, which is exciting. But the fact that this group is invested in me, they're invested in this program, they're invested in Rutgers Volleyball, and they want to make a mark for themselves. It's They have this determination and this fire. So regardless of the age, I think that, yes, there's going to be some matches that we might win that we're not supposed to we might lose when we're not supposed to that's just happens when you have a, a younger team but the reality is is the experience they are going to gain at this be able to be you know on a team that out of 11 of them someone's got to play right so it's a matter of they're going to get a lot of experience very young and obviously the big 10 is such a tough grind each and every year the non-conference and the start becomes so important last year your program got off to the best start in a quarter century how key will that be this year, especially when you look at your schedule and you consider that just one of your first eight matches is actually at home? Yeah, the way that I looked at preseason this year, in the past I used to start off a little bit slower and build up into Big Ten play. We're trying the reverse this year where we're going to go out and play a couple of, of other um, – power institutions right away and then kind of lean ourselves into the Big Ten play, which obviously is a gauntlet. And you have to make sure that physically and mentally we are ready to go. So with a young team, I want to give them a little bit of hopefully some rest leading into Big Ten play. But, um, you know, I'm excited about their potential. And I think that it's a matter of my goal this year is to go above 500. I mean, as a program, we have not been above 500 in, you know, the history of us being in the Big Ten. And that is 100 percent the goal for this season. Obviously, the fan support for volleyball is massive at basically every school. What did the move to Jersey Mike's for most of your home games do in terms of the fan support and getting the Rutgers community really behind the volleyball program and where you eventually want it to be? Yeah, I was very grateful to, to Pat Hobbs and to our administration for allowing us to move over into Jersey Mike's Arena. And that was a huge step. It just shows how serious that Rutgers is taking the volleyball program. The opportunity to play in a, an arena that has all of all of the lights and cameras and TVs, opportunities, all the things that allow us to get onto the network and, and just get our, our program showcased, not only internally when you have your fans in the stands, it makes it for a more comfortable environment for them to play, to watch a match, but also externally, people are able to now really get a nice view of what the program is doing. I think it's probably easier for a coach and a coaching staff to assess physically when your team is ready to match up. How do you know mentally when your team is ready to deal with the kind of opposition and the environments that you have to deal with on a weekly basis inside the Big Ten? It's a great question. <laughs> uh, I think that that's something that is a little unknown, right? I think we're going to have to, that's going to be a challenge for us as we go through the season. It's nice, the two uh, young women that I have here with me today, they both saw significant playing time last season. So even though we are youthful, we are experienced. And I think that even though our leadership is young, they still have been through this one, two years and seen the challenges that they face, not only from opposition on the other side of the net, but also what 
what playing in environments that are loud and crowded and when teams are not always nice or fans are not always super nice right standing behind you when you're trying to serve the ball with symbols in their hands but it's something that our true freshmen are going to have to learn and adapt to but because we have experience as the players that are our sophomores have that experience as freshmen I think we're, we're ready to go you referenced the two student athletes that are here with you Alyssa Kinkella and Taylor Humphrey tell us a little bit about those two women before we get a chance to chat with them here in a second Sure, I'll start with Alyssa. Alyssa is a student athlete from Australia, so she travels very, very far <laughs> all the way to New Jersey, and um, she's really grown in her presence and in her skill. We've moved her from the left side to the right side, and, and she can transition between both. I hope to see her play six rotations this season. That's a goal for us, is to run a dynamic offense from all areas of the court, not just from, from the front line. But um, she, she's played on and off her first year. She's a little beat up at times, you know, some injuries here and there, but she's ready to go and really excited and just really grown in her leadership potential. Um, and Taylor was a true freshman last year, and she was played more minutes than any points, minutes, whatever you want to say, than any other player on the team. So I think from just feeling comfortable on the court and feeling really, really solid during Big Ten play, I'm not worried about her at all. Kaylin Schweighoffer, head coach at Rutgers. We really appreciate the time. Of course, best of luck to you and the Scarlet Knights in 2023. Great. Take a look at a few key dates for Rutgers. September 1st on the road. Always nice to play. And Coach Schweighoffer mentioned those Power 5 non-conference opponents. NC State on 9-1. Purdue matchup comes away September 24th at Iowa on October 27th. Taking on Michigan State on November the 18th. Alyssa Kinkella, Taylor Humphrey are the student athletes with us here in studio. Getting to enjoy a little bit of Chicago before our visit. We may or may not discuss their thoughts on Deep Dish Pizza coming up in just a bit. We will definitely discuss the 2023 season for Rutgers women's volleyball. And a couple of sophomore outside hitters. Alyssa Kinkella on the outside. Taylor Humphrey next to me here on set. As I mentioned to Coach, you're the only team that is represented by two underclassmen this week at Volleyball Media Days. So as players who are, I guess, fairly young in terms of the overall atmosphere in Big Ten Volleyball, how do you still embrace being leaders on this team? And Taylor, I'll start with you. You know, I think uh, we are a young squad this year, but having some playing experience is going to be very helpful. You know, we have a couple of freshmen who I think are going to play important roles this year. So just being able to talk to them about what it's like playing with all the noise, what it's like playing with all the fans, and just preparing in the gym every day at a high level. So when it gets to game time, it's nothing new. How I embrace that leadership is I have been, this is my third year coming into the game. So first year I was unfortunately injured. So I kind of joke with Caitlin that it's a, a um, blessing in disguise because I was able to integrate myself into Big Ten Volleyball from the sideline. So I was able to use that knowledge into my second season and able to lead the group with what I've seen and what I've observed from the sideline and hopefully from last season's knowledge I can bring that into this season's. Uh, how did you get from Melbourne to the banks <laughs> at Rutgers? Oh by plane first but um, <laughs> I, I, it was a few years ago, like four or five years ago, I was like, okay, what can I do to further my career in volleyball? And I was like, oh, college seems like a great idea. So I did my profile, I sent it out to many colleges, and Rutgers really stood out to me as a star school to come to. Taylor, coach mentioned how many sets, how many minutes you played as a freshman last year. What was that experience like? Because I know other coaches have told me that Hitting that wall late in the season is a very real thing for you. Uh, did that occur with you? Do you feel like you're more equipped maybe to even build on what was an outstanding freshman season? Thank you. Um, I think I can't determine a specific point where I felt like I hit the wall, but as the season goes on, traveling day in, day out, keeping up with school, keeping up with you know treatment on your off day, it can definitely be draining. So going into this year, having played significant time, I think I am – uh, well equipped to give more back to my team, you know, be able to help them out more uh, when we're on the road and be that shoulder that they can lean on if it gets you know, tiring for some of the freshmen. Having gone through that first year and playing in some of these road environments, which one did you think was the toughest? The toughest? They're all so fun. I, I enjoy playing in uh, away arenas because the fans are so rowdy and it just gets so loud. I had a lot of fun playing in Purdue last year. Their band is pretty rowdy. They are. <laughs> Alyssa, what about you in terms of going on the road? Was there anywhere you really enjoyed or anywhere that you found to be difficult to actually be able to hear enough and get into the groove enough to play the way you wanted to play? 
Yeah, no, that's a good question. I, I always enjoy travelling. Obviously, I travel very far, so I enjoy airports and everything. The long bus rides are a bit hard to do, though, sometimes, but I have to agree with uh, Taylor. Purdue and Penn State are probably one of the toughest uh, with uh, determining fa fan sections. They're very tough to play with because they're always in your ear and the bands are very loud, which I'm clearly not used to coming from Australia, but at the same time, that is something very unique to my experience and I wouldn't give it up any other day. All right, Alyssa, I'm, I'm going to finish with you because I did a deep dive into everybody's bios and one thing jumped out more than anything to me. You named the hedgehog as your spirit animal, and I, and I need to know where on earth something like that came from. <laughs> Look, that was that was probably two years ago when I made that decision, and Taylor and I recently took a spirit animal test because yes. we knew we and were going to... it was not a hedgehog? No, I was a horse <laughs> for some reason. It was something something to do with loyalty and being slow to trust others, so I need to up that, that, update that bio and say it's a horse for me. <laughs> and yours was? A shark. Ooh. Perfect for Shark Week. And I was going to say, we're just Perfect on the heels shark of Shark Week. Week. Great time. Taylor <laughs> Humphrey, Alyssa Kinkella, we truly appreciate you being with us today. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. It has been a block party in College Park since Adam Hughes took over as head coach. The coaching background is evidence. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. Three and a third blocks per set led the NCAA, a huge reason why this team defensively was so successful and led to overall success in the 2022 season as well. Entering year six under Adam Hughes, you'll see him in a little bit. He doesn't look like he's nearly old enough to have been there that long. <laughs> Won seven Big Ten games in back-to-back -back seasons for the first time under coach and recorded road and home wins against top ten opposition in the same season for the very first time in program history. Here is proof positive. Adam Hughes, yes, he is really that deep into his career at Maryland. Does it go as fast as we seem it has gone? It's surreal, realistically. Um, you know, I feel like I'm working my way up in the tenure of coaches. And, uh, you know, we're hoping to be at Maryland for a very long time. I hope I'm going to be a lot more great uh, next time I do this. We talked about the fact that you have won road and home games last year against top 10 opposition. It was the first time ever in program history that that happened at Maryland. What does that tell you about how close the team is to being able to go anywhere at any time against any opponent and do what needs to be done to win a match? Yeah, I mean, even looking back two years ago, we were fortunate we were able to beat Wisconsin at home, and that was a nice five-game win. But, you know, we were trying to keep building and keep building, and last year having two significant top ten wins I think kind of moved us in another direction. And realistically, we want to make the NCAA tournament. I mean, that's something that we've been cracking at. We've been close. We've been close. And for us to do that, we just have to be a little bit more consistent. So I think the belief in the program is very high, and now we just got to be able to, you know, do it a little bit more consistently than we've been able to do in the past. Winning on the road is so difficult in this league. And last year you won three consecutive road series. And that doesn't happen for many teams at all in this league, really in the country. What goes into winning on the road, especially when you have to play at places like Penn State, like Wisconsin, like Minnesota? Sure. Yeah, I mean, Purdue is one of those Purdue wins. Well. And it's a really challenging place with just the student section right behind you. And um, again, I think when we looked two years ago, we were really good at home. And uh, we put a point of emphasis saying, hey, we need to be better at just our process, getting ready to play, whether it's home or away, kind of reframing whatever that energy is towards what our, our goal was. And so we were pretty good on the road, got a little bit of a streak. And, um, you know, again, trying to now tie two years ago go to last year and hopefully put it together this season. Uh, one thing that's been really consistent over the last three years, we showed some of the graphics and the numbers about this team's blocking ability. We've led the Big Ten in that category for three straight years. Yeah. No team had done that since Penn State did it for six consecutive years. So how much of your coaching background is the reason behind that emphasis with your program? Well, I think it's been a staff-wide thing. We made a big change about four years ago and said, hey, we're going to not uh, rely on just one person to do something. We're going to make sure it's a team effort. And um, we were able to move up the rankings going from 11th to 8th to 5th to now 1st the last couple of years. So I didn't know that uh, six years is the number to beat now, but now I've got a big target and I have to do it. Halfway there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that seems like a long way away. Yeah. Obviously, you've beaten 10, I believe, or nine of the other conference opponents. Penn State, Nebraska, Minnesota, Illinois are the ones that in conference play, you still are trying to check off that list. I know you don't ever circle matches ahead of time. You're worried about what's in front of you. 
But what does it mean to the program and moving forward as you get to kind of check off all of those different conference opponents and say, we've gotten the best of them at least once? Well, that's been the fun part about Maryland. I mean, we moved to the Big Ten in 2013, and it was almost like a new chapter had kind of begun. And so I think a lot of the athletes that we have and coaches are all just trying to cross off new things. And so for us, uh, you know, I don't circle anyone specific. I want to try to see if we can beat everyone. But I will say, uh, you know, Penn State as an alum would be a nice one to cross off the list. You start the season with a couple of tourneys away from home, uh, Miami, I believe, and then Annapolis. And then, and then you come back for a nice stretch where you get to host a couple, and then you have Howard in D.C. How nice is that kind of early season return? Because there have certainly been years where teams in this league, and perhaps your teams, you spend eight of your first nine, nine of your first ten matches playing away from home and in these early season tournaments. Well, I think the key for us is we wanted to test ourselves a little bit early. You know, we were able to go overseas on a foreign tour and had a great summer experience. And so we decided we wanted to find a team that was going to host a tournament that had NCAA tournament experience. And, you know, we're not going to look past FIU. We play FIU and Miami on the same day. But Miami is literally returning almost an entire roster that was in the NCAA tournament. So for us, we just want to see where we're at and uh, hopefully get off on the right foot. What was that summer tour like for you and the team? Uh, it was incredible. I mean, I've got three daughters. I was able to take my family and to just let the team kind of run with them. There was times where I didn't even know where they were. You know, it's a, it's a cool kind of just bringing the family together. Where'd you go and what'd you get to see other than volleyball? Yeah, we did a really good job of balancing both ends of that. I mean, the front end, we were uh, in Maribor in Slovenia. It's a beautiful countryside and uh, had a great time doing a lot of, like, outside volleyball activities. Um, Pula Croatia was probably my favorite. Team went cliff jumping, um, and it was cool to see. We had a, about a 50-foot cliff, and you could see how ambitious or how brave people were by how far they went up that thing to jump. So I didn't jump at all, but I uh, had some people You're that You're not were, as brave as those, uh, I those not guys standing out there. I had my daughter, so I said, hey, I can't do it, but uh, I let them have some fun. I was in Croatia in June, by the way. It's a phenomenal country. Uh, before we uh, wrap up and get some of your student athletes up here, I'd love to hear a little bit about them. Sam and Sydney are with you. What do they mean to your program? What are they like as both players and people? Yeah, I mean, well, Sid was here last year, and she's been a great representative of our program. She's an ultimate competitor. You know, she's outside right now, probably trying to beat somebody in ping pong or something. And uh, to bring Sam here is also important. You know, uh, Sam was committed to us, and whenever there was a coaching transition, it was fortunate to become the head coach. She recommitted to the cause, and, you know, they're that kind of first group for me that was recruited in 2020, and, you know, see them now be seniors. Hopefully we'll get their super senior year here at Maryland, but got a lot left on the table, but I'm uh, thrilled to bring them here. And obviously an exciting season. Lots to build on, Adam. We truly appreciate the time. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Sam Sire and Sydney Dowler are the student athlete reps for Maryland Volleyball. And everybody needs to take in a little bit of Chicago before they come here and answer the hard-hitting questions. This is one of the more popular pictures we've seen this week. The Bean, formerly known as the Cloud Gate, just off the Mag Mile. Great stuff as we continue on Big Ten Volleyball Media Days. Hashtag B1G First Serve. Sam Sire, Sydney Dowler with us. Thanks so much for being here. I want to start after we just finished with Coach Hughes. He always seems, I've talked to him via satellite, this is the first time in person, seems so chill and laid back. Is he always like that, even at practice, maybe when things don't go well? Sam, I'll start with you. Uh, yeah, I mean, he's one of those to kind of let us figure it out on our own. He's not really one to harp on us a lot. Um, so he's like, you guys take the reins. Figure it out yourself, and um, that's what kind of has helped us grow as players. Yeah, he's a competitive guy. I will preface that, but um, his chill energy stays on the court as it does off the court. He always brings that like constant, um, calm vibe to the court, and I think that really helps us. Obviously, as players who have been around the program for a while and seniors, you are considered. Coach mentioned this kind of leaders on this team. Sydney, for you, what does that mean in terms of your leadership role, not just production? Yeah, uh, leadership, I think, is huge for us in each of our, we've, we've worked really hard, especially on the foreign tour, to each define a leadership role that we can have individually um, as a collective group to, to make ourselves better. So, you know, leadership is huge for us. I think we can all lead together as a group to bring us closer on the court, off the court, everything. Um, it's just really about how the team leads together. Honestly. How do you approach your leadership role, Sam? Yeah, I feel like I can be a huge advocate for the younger uh, freshmen here and even the transfers because they don't know what it's like in our atmosphere and especially me and Sid being vets kind of here for the past three years. Um, we're kind of just going to tell them how it goes, tell them the standard. And I mean, they already know they've been here. They've been to Europe. So we were able to go to Europe and kind of 
just show them this is our culture. This is what it's like. This is what you can be a part of. And, and they're already blending in really well. What was the most amazing part of that trip for you? Oh, the cliff jumping. And so I was, you, you actually did do the jump? I was the, okay. the high one. Oh, yeah. I was sitting there for like 20 seconds debating, and I was like, I'm just going to go. And it was amazing. I'm glad I did it. And I'm sure amazing sights, but also fantastic team bonding to be able to enjoy something like that for everybody to collectively enjoy an experience that probably no one had ever even had individually. Yeah, it was huge to have the freshmen there, too. I mean, I think we bonded like no other. They're fitting right in. Um, we made a huge team connection there, and I'm really excited to bring it to the fall. What did those top 10 wins that you guys posted last year, Sid, one at home, one on the road, what do they do in terms of the confidence level for this team, believing that any night can be your night? I think they show us that we can do it. Like Sometimes it's hard to believe, you know, being ranked lower, things like that, that you're right there with them and that it is close. But when we do snag those wins or like sweep a big team like that, um, it's huge for our confidence. It's huge to show us that we can do it, that we're raising our standard every year, and now we just have to get consistent with it. I spoke at length with Coach Hughes about the emphasis on blocks and how, guy, how good you as a team have been in that regard over the past three years. What's practice like when you get into that kind of session? Well, uh, it's definitely tough, especially when we're playing against someone like Layla Ricks and Anastasia Russ. I mean, those are some, that's a big wall, yep. right? But that's what makes us so good because it allows us to get used to it, too, as hitters. So um, practice is just a lot of technique, and by now we're kind of used to it. So we, um, we get really, really competitive with it, too, in practice. I mean, we're... <laughs> For you, I know you ranked top 10 last year in the conference, I believe, in kills and points per set. So take me through your mindset. Let's say it's an in-system ball and you're getting ready for a swing, what's kind of going through your mind as you're seeing where the ball is hopefully going to apex and what you want to do to make it as good as it can possibly be? Yeah, um, I just kind of see where the set is. I mean, usually Sid puts up a pretty good set and I'm like, all right, where can I take this? I kind of try to see ahead of me and look at the block and if the ball's moving a little bit to my left. I'm just going to kind of go line. So it's kind of in the moment thing. And if I see what's in front of me, if I can sneak it through there and if I got to put a tip in, that's what I'm going to do. So, um, yeah, and I'm just used to kind of being comfortable in uncomfortable situations. So it's kind of helped my past three years. Well, I'll flip it then for you because she just pointed out how important the set for you is. If she's going to make that kind of swing, then what are you thinking in your position? Uh, my hitters make it really easy for me, and so do my passers. I mean, they set me up in a great position. I feel comfortable setting anybody at any time. Um, I love giving Sam the ball. We have a, we've had a great few four years now, three years, three years. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's just fun out there, honestly, to, to throw the ball around and see what everybody can do. When you committed, said you were just the 10th Under Armour All-American at that point to commit to play volleyball for Maryland. So what led you to make that decision? Honestly, everything. I love this school with my whole heart. We have a great staff. They are the most loving, supporting people. It really feels like a family there. The team is great. Um, again, like we just have this, such a great family atmosphere around us. Like There's nobody on the team that I feel like I couldn't just reach out to if I needed help or or go hang out with on a random day. Um, so it's just the atmosphere of the whole school. It's in a great environment, a, a great education. Um, there is nothing that, that I could see at fault with the school. Sam, and I'm not asking you to name specific numbers of wins or how far you guys may go, but for you at the end of the year, what would make this, what would make 2023 a successful season for you in Maryland Volleyball? Just continue building. This past three years, we kind of rebuilt our program. And I mean, throughout the years, you've seen such tremendous improvement. Um, and so this year, I think we're going to kind of bring out that competitiveness a little bit more and kind of work really, really hard to show people that we can stand with any, any team at any moment. And so I think everyone's ready for that. And we're all, we're all really competitive teams. So we're ready to go. It sounds like you guys love where you are. I'm sure you love playing at home. Uh, where do you not love playing? What do you think is the toughest place to play when you leave College Park? I would say Minnesota. I think that's pretty tough for me. Um, I don't know Why? what it is. I don't know if it's just, I don't know. And no one really screams at you either. So maybe yeah. that's because I'm used to like all like the loud noises. And I'm like, this is kind of different and I'm not used to it so I think that's why it's hard for they've me. also had the last three Big Ten players of the year come through there <laughs> yeah, so that too. never an easy trip <laughs> either what about for you Sid yeah um 
Probably, probably Minnesota. Maybe, maybe Illinois. Actually, I think that, like the big gym with the fans a little farther, an older crowd who's a little quieter. Yeah. What about on the flip side? Is there a road environment that you really enjoy oh, going to? Purdue. Yeah. I think Purdue is a lot similar to ours as well because it's just you're really close. They're really close to the court, and so we're used to that, and it makes it so fun. I mean, their student section is amazing. I mean, they were talking to Sid last year while she was in the middle of serving. So um, there, I think it's a great environment there. Well, we have to know before we let you go, what was that conversation like? <laughs> are, they, are they talking politics? Are they talking news and weather together? They were just, they were like, there was a weird play and the refs were talking for probably like three minutes. It was going on forever. And I was back to serve, just standing there with the ball and the whole crowd is like, ah, <laughs> behind me. And I was like, wow, they're like still doing this. They're going on for a long time. And I saw my, my teammates start to do it to me behind me, too. So I just, like, turned around and did it back to them. And, yeah, a lot of people found it funny. You can prep and practice for a lot of stuff. I'm not sure there's prep and practice for that, and I'm sure you handled it very well. Sam Sire, Sydney Dowler, terrific representatives for Big Thank Ten you. Women's Volleyball and for the University of Maryland. We appreciate the time. Thank, Thank you. you. The history is there. 42 straight NCAA tournament appearances. Penn State, the only team to make every single tournament. Look hard at that 1999 photo. I'm not sure if you might see Katie Schumacher calling in there. You're about to see her in just a second. But the history is there. The numbers are there. The recent success and NCAA championships there as well. Nothing short of an amazing run for the Penn State Nittany Lions on the volleyball court. Obviously trying to keep that rolling in 2023, entering year two under Coach Schumacher Cauley, finishing 26-8 and eight overall last season, going to the NCAA Regional Semis, and seven players on this year's roster have already earned all-conference honors. And Coach Schumacher Cauley is with us. Coach, thanks so much for being with us. Did those pictures flashing by bring back yeah, any memories? Those are great. I love the old photos. It's awesome. When you start to think about your role now and your role then with Penn State and, and what this program has always been and will continue to be for women's college volleyball. What do you think about first and foremost? You know, I think it's it's a privilege to be a part of Penn State and a part of this conference. And, you know, I'm honored to be leading this team. Um, I've learned so much from Coach Rose and, um, you know, some other mentors that I've had. But I'm, I'm just so happy to be here and I'm excited for this team. Um, they've had a great summer. They've been together a lot, which, is, which will be helpful. As you kind of did your year-end self-scout, which I know every staff does, what was your overall assessment of year one? It was fast and furious. Um, I, I was proud of the way the team got better as the season went on. And, you know, they, they competed really hard. Uh, there are a lot of players that, you know, I think some people didn't hear about. And I thought that, you know, we competed, got better, and we're great teammates. You mentioned Coach Rose. I'm curious, when did the nerves start going away after replacing someone who's literally considered uh, an absolute legend in this sport? I, I don't think ever, but... They're um, still there today? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, it's a special place, and you know, I'm, I'm just excited, and I think I'll always have that little nervous edge. I know it's probably impossible to list just one or two things, but what did you take away from your time with Russ that you'll always try to apply to your teams? Yeah, I think for me, it was, you know, he always told me to be myself and um, to always compete. So I think that, you know, there are a lot of lessons that we learned, but I think just to compete and to, to do your best. I'm sure winning the first 12 helped ease those nerves a little yeah. bit, but as we all know, the finish is a little bit more important than the start, and you had a great run and that epic five-setter to Wisconsin at the end. Is there truly such a thing with roster turnover and changes that every team has to endure as taking momentum from the end of one season to the start of another? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm really proud of our returners. Um, I think they've done a great job, and I think that they're, they're eager to let the new players know what we need and how to win and what's expected of them at Penn State. So, yeah, I mean, momentum is, yeah, we'll get, we got a couple tough uh, matches right away. So that will put us in our place and let us know what we have to do. I know you necessarily haven't got to spend a ton of time yet with your team mm -hmm. as a group. You'll get to do that once the NCAA says, obviously, it's okay. But in terms of that integration, the new players, uh, the freshmen, the transfers with the returnees, what does a coaching staff want to see to tell you that that chemistry is getting to the point where it needs to be before opening night? Yeah, again, I, I, I put a lot on our returners to welcome the new players, whether they're transfers or freshmen. And 
I thought that they did an excellent job this summer incorporating everyone and um, you know they worked out together they spent a lot of time off the court together and uh, I'm proud of them. The transfer portal has changed a little bit of the way the rosters are made up. Certainly changes your roster with all Big Ten performers and Mac and Jess coming from other Big Ten teams to your squad. How did that process unfold? You know, I, I think that these players have an opportunity to graduate where they're at and, you know, whether or not their scholarship situation was different at the school they were coming from. Um, you know, we had some scholarships and I'm, I'm really excited about the players we have and also with Ali Van Ekeren and Cam Hanna and Lena. Um, you know, I think it's a really dynamic group. What do Mac and Jess specifically do for you in terms of the way you can play and the way you want to play? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that they're experienced. Um, they can play fast. Uh, they know the league. They know these gyms. And uh, I think they're, they're eager to compete in the blue and white. You mentioned a tough start. I'm always interested in the philosophy of coaches who have to go through this Big Ten gauntlet and what you want to do in the non-conference because you want to get your teams ready but you don't want to tire your teams out and you don't want to be a situation where you get into the Big Ten and you have to go three or four games above 500 just to be NCAA tournament eligible. So what's your philosophy when it comes to scheduling the non-con? Well, you know, we were invited to play in this tournament in Tampa, and I think it's a great experience for our team to play at the Final Four venue, to play a team like Florida and Georgia Tech right off the bat. So, you know, I think if you're, you want to be the best, you got to compete and be ready to go right away. Here are some of those key dates. You're on the road against Louisville on September 10th, and then a couple of those Big Ten matchups, the bottom two against Ohio State and Wisconsin at home, the road match against Minnesota on September 30th. You really can't look at the Big Ten schedule as a whole. I think most coaches would tell you they don't want their players to do that because there are stretches of four or five matches that if you look at them in their entirety, they almost seem overwhelming. How do you want your team to look and handle the schedule that's in front of them? Yeah, you know, we prepare week by week, so I think it's, you know, what's ahead of you for that weekend, and we do our best to prepare the players, and, you know, they're committed to what they have to do to be great. So we go one week ahead. Who will be some of the leaders on this team that you will rely on as you talk about the seniors and the veterans to be around and make sure that that integration is where you want it to be? Yeah, you know, I think both Zoe and Allie, who are here today, you know, I, I expect them to, to do a lot on and off the court. Um, you know, I think Quinn Menger is a great leader for us. And, you know, I'm, I'm expecting all 19 players to, to have an impact on this team. Share with us a little bit more about those two student athletes that we'll hear from in just a minute. Let's start with Zoe. Zoe is a dynamic physical player that everyone likes to watch play. Um, she's a great person, and I'm super proud that she's a Penn Stater and that, you know, she has one more season. What about Allie? Allie has improved so much and is so committed to her skills, and I'm just I'm so happy for her. Coach, when I talk with other players, I, one of the questions I love to ask is, what road environment do you absolutely hate going to because it's so loud, you just don't want to deal with it? Most people answer Penn State, Purdue. That, the coach, kind of the most popular answers. What do you look at as being your biggest home court advantage? You know, I think our fans are awesome. We have a wrecking crew that is our student uh, section. Um, they love volleyball. They're, they love our players. They um, love the Big Ten. Do you have a road environment that you think is difficult to go to and win in? Oh, gosh. You know, we really struggled at Illinois last year. I thought that was a tough, loud environment. And, um, yeah, I would say Illinois last year. All right, let's finish with this before we take a break and chat with your players. How do you know from a mental perspective that your team is ready for the grind that is the Big Ten? Well, I don't know if you ever really know, but I, I know that they're, they're eager to start preseason. I know that they're eager to help one another and that they're going to work really hard. Katie schumacher Cauley, head coach Thank of you. Penn State. We appreciate the time. Thank you. Oh, if you like to watch Penn State women's volleyball, the good news is that 11 matches will be televised. It's a good reason why. One of the best teams, not just in the Big Ten, but in the country, one of the best home environments and a history, as we have discussed that is truly unmatched. A couple of outstanding Penn State players are with us. Zoe Weatherington, 
Allie Holland, welcome into the studio. How has the experience been so far coming into Chicago, getting ready for Big Ten Volleyball Media Days? I know a lot of this with the cameras and the lights, it's new for a lot of people. So, Allie, what's it been like for you so far? Oh, my God. It has been so much fun. It's a very quick trip here in Chicago, but anytime I get to hang out with my girl Zoe, <laughs> we're having a good time. So, it's been crazy, and the Big Ten headquarters has been treating us so well. I feel like a celebrity. You enjoying it, Zoe? Yes. I mean, we're so – the Big Ten really takes care of us. We have – a little entourage, people following us around, giving us waters and stuff. I've never been treated so well. So, For you, for both of you, 2022 was a little bit of a transition with a new head coach coming in after Coach Rose leaves. That transition seemed from the outside, Zoe, it seemed pretty seamless. Was it that simple on the inside as you guys made the transition to a new coaching staff? I mean, I wouldn't say it's seamless. I think we had a lot of hard work to do when we first got in the gym, and it was a big change from you know Pac-12 to Big Ten because that speed of the game is different the physicality of the players is different but Katie made it really easy for me and my new teammates in the new environment was really perfect. Allie? Oh my god I mean I think that we did a great job handling all the changes you know we have a lot of people coming in a new staff but I seriously like love the staff so much they've just given me such a new light and love with the sport of volleyball and it's been great. Well, Zoe, you mentioned the Pac-12, and for those that don't know, you came out of Charlotte High School but started at Utah, and then you made the transition, and then obviously there was that coaching change. There's been a lot of transition for you. What's your volleyball journey been like over the past, let's say, five, seven years? I think it's just been a long learning experience that I'm really grateful to have. Um, I'm glad I can say that I've had a unique journey um, and that I've gotten to experience different environments because I have more perspective on the game, I like to think. But now that I'm at Penn State, I really couldn't be happier. Ali, how do you see your growth as kind of a person and a player during your career at Penn State? My God, Penn State has just played such a pivotal role in my academic, athletic, and professional goals. But coming from freshman year to now, it's just the dream of playing at Penn State, the dream of playing with the girls I'm playing with and playing in these gyms is like pinch me almost like it's really amazing so I'm super proud of myself I'm proud of the team of how far we've come since I've been here freshman year. for both of you and I'll start with you here Allie what does that mean in terms of the way that you're able to handle the incoming freshmen knowing what you know now and maybe more importantly knowing what they think they know <laughs> but they don't actually know Oh, well, I think that it's it's nice to handle the freshmen, especially because that used to be us. You know, we know what we would have liked to hear and what we would have needed to hear our freshman year. Our freshmen are great. They're so sweet. They're so cute. They're excited to be on campus. They're ready to go. And, you know, they're working hard in our summer workouts. So I'm super excited for them. How do you handle the youngsters on the team? I think it's fun. It's nice having people come in that are just kind of like new and they're moldable and they're able to adjust it's like hard breaking some like little bad habits maybe but a lot all of our freshmen come in knowing what Penn State is all about so they're they're ready how do you as leaders and veterans on this team even if you've only played one year here you start to see new players coming in from other Big Ten schools, which is happening more than it's ever happened before. You have two of the more impactful and Mac and Jess coming into your program. Uh, do you remember, Zoe, what you thought when you heard about the news that they were coming into your program and, and how have they been integrated? Oh, I remember. I was jumping for joy. Um, having two players like that, I mean, all of our transfers are great. So knowing that they're coming in here, I just know that we're really stacked with talent and the hard work an effort will come with it because they come from great programs as well. Um, so I'm just excited. What is the key to finding the right chemistry that you need with a group that changes each and every year? Yeah. Well, I think we're super adaptable. I think that everyone on the team is not only great players, but they're great people. So we've got to spend the summer getting to know each other, hanging out both on and off the court. And I think that we've just had such a fun summer and we're so excited to start preseason together. Uh, take me into a home game for you guys. Big time night game, Big Ten game game or a non-conference match against mm -hmm. a top 10 opponent what's that environment like for your home matches it's it's wild it's really a dream come true because I remember the reason I wanted to play college volleyball is because I sat in nationwide arena for the 2016 final and saw it packed and I saw the impact that women's sports could have and that was instantly my goal so getting to play in rec hall all the time with the blue band with the wrecking crew it's really a dream come true it's so loud like sometimes you can't even hear it's like vibrating the floor it's really exciting yeah well i'm glad you brought up the impact uh, on women's sports and what this sport has become really since both of you 
have been in college. The popularity and the visibility have gone just through the roof. Fox announced yesterday there will be national broadcasts of a couple of Big Ten games on an NFL Sunday. We have seen this sport get to levels of visibility on different networks that has never been before. How proud are you to be a part of that? I literally have chills as you're saying this. Like, this is literally a dream come true for me. And the fact that I get to meet little girls that also have the dream of playing in college, like, that's what really makes it for me. That's what keeps me going is, like, the sisterhood of college volleyball, all my friends on my team and the other teams and the little girls that look up to us. Zoe, has it become evident to you just what your sport has become and how it has changed just in the time that you've been playing in college? Yes, I mean, NIL and the extra visibility is great. I mean... It has its perks, but it's also hard because you know you're even more in the spotlight than we were before. Um, I think that now we really get to see who's looking up to us and like who's just paying paying attention to us. Katie always tells us that people are watching, and it's more rings true now more than ever. Yeah, more people are watching than ever before. Mm -hmm. For you, volleyball has been a way of life for a long time. Your mom is the current coach at Charlotte. Uh, so what's that like, the balance between having a mom who's also a coach, but you also have a coach who's your coach? It's great. I think I think it is a bit of an advantage, if anything. I think I have a unique perspective on the game because my mom, but also my dad is a commissioner of a D2 league, so I get to see the administrative side as well. Um, I think I'm able to have a little bit more insight than other players um, on the recruiting side too. Um, I think I had a little bit of a leg up because I was just, my mom just told me like, hey, you need to do this. You need to send emails. You need to, and she always just kept me on the straight and narrow and supported me in my process going through schools and stuff. So I'm just grateful for that because I know it's a unique thing that doesn't happen to every player. Yeah, If you're comfortable, share some of the details of those conversations. Are they more mom-daughter talk? Are they more coach-player talk? Or is there a mix of both? It's definitely mom-daughter. Um, my mom has never personally coached me. Um, we've always kept that boundary kind of away because I know business and family going together isn't always a great mix. Um, she always just has been very supportive and cheerful and that's always her job. She just sits on the side and cheers for me and um, I like that she gives me like feedback when I need it and then when I want it to, but uh, it's not like overbearing and uh, yeah, it's just an extra perk, I feel like. Allie, as a returning all Big Ten selection, obviously the expectations are there, but you also don't want to put too much pressure on yourself. How do you balance doing exactly that? Oh boy, I think it's it's tough to look ahead at the whole season and the end result. I think I'm locked in for preseason. I'm locked in one match at a time. Um, and I really think it's about building the chemistry with my setters and um, making sure that we can get good passes and stuff like that. I think it's really a whole team effort. But I'm, I'm taking it one game at a time, one set at a time, and that's what gets through long season. You know coaches love to hear that answer. I think, <laughs> I, I think Coach might be over there smiling right now as you answer one game at a time one set at a time. What's the best part about working your way through the Big Ten schedule and the road trips that you get to make in this league? Well, it's definitely busy and it's definitely grueling and long, but that's what I signed up for. You know, I signed up to be playing on TV against the best teams in the country week after week after week. But um, again, taking it one week at a time, you know, focusing on the opponents for that weekend and, and taking that into practice. But yeah, it's I mean, it's super exciting. My fourth season, it's it's really unreal. Do you have a favorite or a least favorite place to play away from Rec Hall? Uh, he said away from Rec Hall. Dang. Um, I would say my favorite place to play is probably Indiana. Um, the girls like leave us nice little like gifts in the locker room and stuff, and they're all sweet. And the facility there is like brand new, and it's it's not too intimate and close, but it's just mm -hmm. it's just right. Least favorite, uh, I'm gonna. Have or at to least go. maybe hardest to play at. Hardest to play at, I'm gonna have to go Wisconsin. Um, obviously, that was our last game that we played, but that was tough because they were they were definitely cheering on Wisconsin in there and we had our little support section, but it was it was it was tough. Obviously that was a phenomenal match during a great run for you guys in the postseason. How much do you still think about it? Does it motivate you or is it time to say that's in the past, we're moving on? Well I've thought about it every single day since we've had that match and, and we're hungry to get in season and get ready to to play again. Like Playing a five-setter, taking it to the very end like that with a great Wisconsin team, I mean, it's it's exciting, but also the second the last ball drops, I'm I'm ready for the next game. I'm thinking about it every single day. Does it motivate you as well? Um, 
It does, but I, I'm, I'm more of I got to leave it in the past. This is a new season. It's my last season. I can't really go into it with any baggage or any thoughts of what might have, could have been better, you know, and there's always the shoulds and the coulds and all that, but it's a new year and it's looking up for us. It was an amazing year. It's been an amazing run for Penn State, as we mentioned, the only program to make every single NCAA tournament representatives like this. The reason why, Allie Holland, Zoe Weatherington, thanks so much for being with us. Thank Wish you. you guys a successful season. Stay healthy. Preseason volleyball poll was released on Tuesday. Wisconsin received 13 of 14 votes, and there are many reasons why. Badgers coming off four straight outright Big Ten regular season titles. They do return more than three-quarters of their total production from last season's Elite Eight team. But when you look closer into those numbers, the Badgers return more than 90% of production in terms of kills, assists, and digs. The schedule, in a word, brutal. 13 matches against teams that were ranked in the final poll in 2022. And the head coach of the Badgers, Kelly Sheffield, is with us. Uh, the first little nugget on that graphic mentioned that it's been 11 years now. Does it seem like a decade has gone by? Hmm. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's been a great ride. I mean, you know, just uh, be able to work in, uh, you know, Wisconsin and, and raise your family in Madison. It's, it's, it's an awesome, awesome place. Uh, excited about the future, no doubt about it. Kelly, as has been the case for the last couple of years, uh, you are the hunted, not mm -hmm. the hunter. How much do you want the team to embrace that role? Uh, I don't know if we talk much about it. You know, it's, uh, we want to be consistent. There's so much meat on the bone as far as how much better we can get, uh, which is exciting. Uh, we, we need to continue to get better. Last year, was, last year we had a pretty young team. We graduated a massive uh, group of people the year before. We were pretty young, pretty inexperienced. Uh, went with a uh, with the new system with our 6-2 with MJ and, and Izzy. And, uh, you know, we've got a lot of those players coming back. We bring in two uh, really exciting transfers as well. So we've got a little bit more experience this year. So we're just trying to be as, as good as we can. I don't know if we've ever really t thought about here, we're going to hunt. We, I think hunting is what we're always wanting to do. You know, it's a, uh, nobody gets a head start in this league. You know, we don't start out, you know, three and zero, and everybody chasing us. So it's, uh, you know, let's, let's go. Everybody does start zero and zero, but you're the only team that can say we were big 10 champs last year. And you've been able to say that for four consecutive seasons. Yeah. Have you allowed yourself or the players to grasp the enormity and just how impressive that is in this league at this stage? Yeah, it's a, uh, it's, you appreciate because of, of how good the competition is. But it's, it's a, uh, the, the fun is the climb. The fun is the chase. And, uh, and, and that becomes new every year. Uh, that, that process of building teams and going after and then, and then trying to move on to the next match quickly. This conference forces you to do that. It, uh, you, you can't hang on a previous win. You can't hang on, on a previous loss. Uh, th there's there's joy into that, and so it's this whole new season. It's uh, that there's the fun of is what is in front of you, not not what is behind you. And part of that process was at the end of the regular season last year. And as good as you guys had been, you had to win three straight over top yeah. 15 opponents at the end of the regular season. All three of those matches were on the road yeah. in really tough places to yeah. play. What was so special about that particular run to get you guys last year's title? It was a grinder. I mean, yeah, you, you talked about the three in a row. The final weekend, we're playing, we're playing the late match at, at Nebraska and then uh, flying to the east, uh, lose an hour there for the early match at Ohio State. And uh, we had plane delays there, so we didn't get well, in until like 4 o'clock in, yeah. in, in the morning. There was a... Uh, you know, and we wanted at Nebraska to, to go and, and find a way to win a great match at Ohio State in that environment. Uh, it, it's a gritty group. It's a, uh, you know, they, they're trying for more than just to, to win. They want to play well. I think that's, we feel like if we're, if we're playing well, we've got a chance most nights. We had the final four in three of those last four seasons. I remember talking with Dana Redke mm -hmm. after the 21 championship. I think it was the next morning. I don't think she had gone to bed. She was holding onto the trophy yeah. like it wasn't going anywhere. Uh, even this deep into your career and as many deep runs as your teams have made, what are you still learning and what are those final four trips still teach you about what it takes to win at the highest levels? Uh, it's, it, it, the fun is, is the learning. It is, and 
I feel like I'm still, uh, I've got so much more room to grow. Our, our team has so much room to grow. Uh, what have we learned? You, you, you have to be gritty. You, you have to, to, to be that. It's, uh, you know, I think you'll have MJ, Inch, uh, MJ, MJ Hamill uh, uh, up here. And uh, that's one of her favorite words is, is, is gritty. You've got, you've got to do that. You've got to move on quickly to, to the next play, the next, uh, the next match. Um, it's, uh, you know, and, and you've got to find that balance of pushing your team and, and, and pulling off. And, and uh, that, that can be a tough balance as well. And now with the, how big the conference is and how much bigger that it's getting, you know, of dealing with the travel uh, part of it. And it, when I first got into this, this was a league that you pr- pretty much played Friday, Saturday. And there was a rhythm to every week. And, and now because of TV that we're blessed to be on so much, you, the week uh, rhythm is very, very different. from, And, uh, and so tap the, the resource that you have around the app athletes, the trainers and the strength coaches and, and the nutritionists and the massage therapists, all those things become a lot more important, how you travel. I know you talk about the ability to move on, whether it's after a win, after a loss, the epic five-setter last year that ended the season. How long did you allow yourself or the players to kind of chew on that, think about it? Do some of them maybe still use it as motivation? Does that apply to you as well? Uh there's a uh, I don't think I use it necessarily as motivation I'm, I'm always there's other things that 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 motivate me I mean just trying to be to be as good as I could possibly be the players you just let it you you know if you need that for motivation if you utilize that for motivation that is great if if uh, if you want to flush it that's fine as well so we'd let that be a little bit more personal that's obviously one of those rare, rare home defeats. But it's in Big Ten matches. I believe you're 27 and one in your last 28 mm. at the Fieldhouse. What makes that environment for you and your players so special? Mm. Fans, uh, it, it, they're waiting at least four hours before match time outside to get in the doors. Uh, so they come in pretty, pretty revved up. It's uh, and, and they're running to their seats. You, you see a, it, and. You know they're on their feet a lot. They are uh, they are coordinated. They are energetic. They're they're fiery. You have 7,500 fans. Uh, that is that in the field house, and it's a it's a fan base that has been active and, and alive and fired up for you know 20, 30 years. And so a lot of them have invested a lot of a lot of their time, a lot of their entertainment dollars and. And uh, to, to support us, they travel with us uh, quite a bit. It's an unbelievable fan base. Kelly, before we dive a little bit deeper into your roster and this year's team, one more big picture question. Do you feel like this sport is maybe in the best spot it's ever been? It's not even close. It's the best, and there's so much more <laughs> that we can be doing, right? It's, you know, the excitement of how many matches are on, uh, on Big Ten Network is, is incredible. You know, to be able to have our championship uh, on, uh, you know, on one of the bigger st- stations as well than what it has been, a bigger platform, bigger audience base for, 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 uh, for the NCAA championship, uh, getting uh, the couple games on Fox. Yeah. It's uh, media days, you know. The, the, you know, we've been a leader here in this conference and in this network uh, for the sport of volleyball. But there's so much more uh, room to go. There's so many more things that we can be doing, um, which, which is exciting, right? How cool is that Fox announcement? It'll be you in Minnesota, and I believe they'll obviously try to yeah. match it up on a Fox NFL Sunday, probably around a Packers game. Well, Packers Vikings right before us is what oh, I'm cool. told, and that that'll be great. It's uh, it's about time, uh, but it's but it's awesome. I mean, it's it's a great opportunity. You know, I don't think there's a, a, a better sport to see in person than, than volleyball. And uh, on TV, I think we've gotten to the point where we've been able to capture it a little bit better. We've learned how that sport shows on on TV. The announcers have gotten a whole lot better as well, and it's gotten to the point where it's it shows really really well. And uh, I, I think to be able to introduce it to, to, uh, to a wider audience, I think they're going to dig their teeth into it. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. I tell anybody who will listen that it is the best spectator sport that college athletics has to offer. There's no waiting. There's unbelievable athleticism, as good as it gets from a spectator standpoint. Into your team and your schedule, I don't want to get any of these wrong, so I'm just going to read a couple of your non-conference games off. Mm-hmm. You have Baylor, Arkansas, Marquette, Florida, all preseason top 25, all in your non-con. Why is that your philosophy? 
I think it's a philosophy of a lot of the coaches in our sport, and I think that's one of the things that makes our sport so much fun is the the, the non-conference. People aren't ducking people. You're, you're not. Uh, they're going right out. They're they're going after heavyweights, and they're saying we'll play you anywhere, anytime, any place. And uh, that's certainly been our philosophy. But I, quite frankly, I think I see that across across our league and uh it's it's why i think one of the reasons why you're seeing so many more non-conference matches on television because uh great teams are they're not ducking each other kelly you have a couple of student athletes here that we'll chat with in just a second mj hamill izzy ashburn tell us a little bit about those two as players and people before we welcome them up for their interviews uh, well, they're, they're going into year two of being captains for us. Izzy, this, is, this will be our fifth year with us. MJ, this will be our fourth year. Uh, we've known both of them a, a long time. Uh, they, they've been coming to our camps when they were young. They, you, you know, for, for Izzy, MJ, she, she committed really early. So they, they know the program. They know what we're about. They carry the culture forward. They're unbelievable leaders. We run a 6-2 offense. Those are our quarterbacks. Uh, and then hopefully we've surrounded them with enough talent that where it's where it's fun to set. I know you don't love to, or most coaches don't love to pick out specific players because everybody on the roster needs to contribute. But there are certainly a lot of volleyball analysts out there that mm-hmm. look back at the year that Sarah had last year and think that she has just scratched her surface. What is her potential? Uh, it's it, really high. I mean, she is a. She, I think she is on, on the verge of being one of the best players in, in, uh, in the country. Uh, you know, on, on the outside, we've got Yuli Orzel, who's been starting for us on the left side for the last two years, uh, going into her junior year. Timmy Thomas is, is, is transferred in. That has got a, you know, a unbelievable ceiling and talent. And we're so blessed to be able to have her. Uh, Carter Booth also transferred in. And, her and Caroline Crawford uh, will be will be huge for us. And on the right, Devin Robinson and Anna Smrek, uh, you know. So we this is the most firepower that that we've had. Uh, we've got a um, our, our backcourt. I feel like we're we're in a better position going into this year than what we were last year. So it's it's exciting. We've got a lot of experience, a lot of a lot of arms, a lot of people that are really driven. Unbelievable schedule, unbelievable roster, and a terrific history, especially recently. Kelly, we truly appreciate the time. Wish you nothing but the best this fall. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Big Ten Volleyball Media Days continues here at the Big Ten Network. Interviews both here on set and our digital studio. Everybody chasing that lovely trophy, the trophy that has belonged to Wisconsin in each of the last four years. Here are some of the key dates for the Badgers. Among that non-conference, such a tough non-conference. I talked about with Coach Sheffield. You have a road match against Florida. And, of course, the Big Ten schedule, those last three all on the Big Ten Network on October 18th at home against Ohio State and then twice over the final five weeks of the season against Nebraska, ending the season at home against the Huskers. Likely some type of conference or tournament implications will be on hand for that one. Welcome in a couple of Badger student athletes. They've been with the program for a while. They do a terrific job as setters, Izzy Ashburn, MJ Hamill. Welcome in. You heard Coach Sheffield talking about what he believes this team is capable of and everyone on the outside has a lot of expectations and belief how do you kind of balance the pressure you put on yourself Izzy with the pressure that you know is on the outside to continue the run that you guys are currently on yeah I would say our team does a really good job not looking outwardly too much we just focus on ourselves and what we can do if we do everything that we can in our gym we know we're giving it our all and that's all we can ask of ourselves and each other and that'll get us to the top level as a group that we can get to Yeah, I mean, pre-rankings, they're very nice to see, and they give you a lot of confidence, I think, for every team. But at the end of the day, you didn't do anything at the beginning of the season. Um, Everything comes from working hard and and being able to actually, you know, perform when when time comes. I'd love to hear from both of you. MJ, I'll, I'll start with you as veterans, as players who have been around this program for a while. How do you view your role in terms of integrating the new players, whether they be transfers or incoming freshmen, and making sure that everybody is exactly where they need to be before you get to opening match night? Yeah, I think we take a lot of inspiration of when we were underclassmen. Uh, We were with Sydney Hilly and Dana Retke, Lauren Barnes, who just in my mind were incredible leaders. Um, We got the opportunity to learn at such a important time in our collegiate career and I think they just allowed 
us to um, amplify our voices no matter our age and and we do the same thing you know we you come to this program for a reason and and that's to compete and everybody knows that coming in and it's just already kind of a mindset and so it's just allowing everybody to shine no matter where um, what age you are your experience anything Izzy it's interesting I'm wondering for you do you know now how little you actually knew as a freshman? Because then you're in the minds of the freshmen that are coming in to join your program right now. Yeah, 100%. I mean, off of what MJ said, something that really helped us this last year was our European tour. And we went on that when I first got to Wisconsin. I'd been here for two weeks. And then we went on the trip. And just looking at the experience then versus now is so different. And I really wanted to use that trip for everybody to to be themselves and to show who they really are, connect as a team. And I feel like that's really going to launch us uh, to the start of the season and it's really brought us closer together. I've never had a team want to hang out as much as we want to just be together all the time and just get to know each other's personalities off the court as well as on the court. Tell us a little bit more about that trip and what were the highlights for you? Yeah, some of the highlights were definitely just doing the experience as a team. Like I was talking about different places in the car just now and I love Slovenia. That was my second time going there. I loved uh, swimming with the team in Milan. I loved going to the Springsteen concert. And then Devin brought up a really good point of our bus rides were so special. Uh, we were playing different games together. We were getting to know each other. We spent a lot of time in the bus, a lot of time traveling, and there wasn't a quiet moment on that bus ride. Um, just getting to know each of our teammates, whether you've played with them for four years like we have, or if you just met them, Temi just came in, and uh, just getting to know each girl individually and just being ourselves and showing our real personality. MJ, did you get to realize in the moment during that trip how special an experience like that truly is? That's actually what I was gonna mention is, those are one of those times where you sit back and you realize I'm playing the sport that I love with my best friends. Um, you know, I, I don't think many people get to have this opportunity and just to look back and realize that I'm surrounded by a family and I'm getting to play teams overseas. And if I were to look at myself now, like if younger me were to look at me, it's like I'm, I'm living the dream, truly. I asked Coach Sheffield about the way that last year ended with that really hard to swallow five set loss. And he said for him individually, he doesn't use it as motivation. He's motivated other ways, but players may approach it in a different fashion. How do you look back on that? Is it a flush it and move on for you or it is a I don't want this to happen again in 2023. I think it was, it, it's more of how we, if you can't look at a loss and learn a lot from it, you're not doing it correctly. Like that losing teaches you just so much about you as a player, how you respond. And it would do us just a disservice if we don't go back and pretty much study that. And that's kind of the route that I take. And, um, you know, there's motivation win or loss you want to do well each year but i think we were able to learn a lot from losses izzy as you start to look at this year's roster i think coach described it as maybe the most firepower the program has ever had from a setter perspective what's that like to look around and know the firepower that is around you and the swings that are most likely coming especially on good in system balls uh, i love having as many options as we have it's a great problem as a setter to have hard decisions to make because there's so many options um I think we just have a lot of firepower hitting. We have a lot of firepower passing. We have a lot of options within it, front row, back row, so many different ways we can run it. And I'm just super excited to see where we can optimize all of our potential and all of our talent and see this team come together. It's almost like an embarrassment of riches, isn't it? Exactly, yes. I mean, it's you, you kind of sit back and you're like, I, that means I have to get better because <laughs> if we're not scoring every point, then I'm doing something wrong. So. It's, it's a good motivator as well, yeah. yeah. I, I understand you have a big family history in volleyball. Your mom played at Clemson, a sister at Middle Tennessee. Correct. Are there arguments in the house about who's the best? You know, I, I wouldn't say it's much of an argument. She's accepted Oh, so, so I assume that's a yes is the answer to that question. <laughs> yes, absolutely. All right, well, the argument has been settled. <laughs> I don't know if anybody else in the Hamill household is really happy to hear about the end of that argument, but we've solved it. MJ Izzy, we appreciate the time. Thank you. The Gophers are in the building, taking on Chicago. Day two of Big Ten Volleyball Media Days. It's not coming soon. It is here. So are Taylor Landfair, Melanie Schaffmaster, and the Minnesota volleyball team. And so is head coach Keegan Cook. Year one, we'll 
chat with Coach Cook in just a second after a very successful eight-year run at Washington. Minnesota has had a ton of success in the Big Ten. Haven't finished outside the top three in a decade. Seven players are back who started games from last year's team that finished with 22 wins overall. And as promised, first-year head coach Keegan Cook is with us in studio. Welcome to the studio and welcome to the Big Ten. Thank you much. Very, very warm welcome from everyone. Uh, What's the acclimation process been like for you after eight years in Washington? Yeah, abrupt. Transitions are abrupt and and you just got to lean into it and ride the wave a little bit. It was uh, was a quick turnaround in December, uh, but I've enjoyed it a lot. When did you start to really feel settled in? Probably not until the snow melted and uh, we got our home. Which is what, like June in Minneapolis? Yeah, maybe? no, it's it's less than what people think. You know, the sun is shining, which I appreciate. But in May, our family got settled in our home, and, and that's been tremendous for us. Obviously, I mentioned you had a great run with the Huskies. Why was this the right move for you at this time? Yeah, it was certainly was unplanned. You know, is what I would say. Um, but the longer you do this, you start to get a calling for, for when it's time to take on a new challenge. And I remember Chris Peterson telling me that a long time ago, former football coach at Washington, and, and um, certainly did not expect Hughes retirement, but uh, something hit me all the way out in Seattle of, of, of who's going to take on that responsibility. And the more I thought about it, I realized, oh, I think it's me. And, uh, and then that was a really um, powerful idea that was hard to shake. As you started to settle into this job and started to get a grasp of what volleyball means to the Minnesota Athletic Department, what what kind of stood out to you as you looked at the big picture of what this program has been, is, and what you ultimately want it to be? Yeah, there's sports fans and there's sports community. And and, and Minneapolis is is a community, the the Gophers. And um, their interest level goes beyond just a passing interest. It's, it's a love for the program. It's a commitment without conditions. And those things really connected with me at a deep level. You mentioned Hugh. You succeed Hugh McCutcheon, won a couple of Big Ten titles, went to the Final Four a couple of times, won right around 79, 80% of his games. Never easy to follow someone who has had that level of success. Yeah. How much do you embrace the past? with the understanding that obviously this is your program now moving forward and you're going to put a stamp on it as well. Yeah, second time I've taken on this challenge, which is a weird niche to find yourself in. Uh, the first time I did it, I was around 28 years old, and, and it, was, it was a lot. Jim McLaughlin built a tremendous program at Washington, and, and taking on that was a huge challenge. And I got through that, and we found our own place uh, in that program, and he said, okay, let's do it again. Uh, but mostly, I think, responsibility is something that's always connected with me as a coach. You want what you do to have deep meaning, and it means something at Minnesota. And so I realized that was uh, the next challenge that I was supposed to take. What were some of those other specific things that you maybe learned in that first transition, whether it be not putting too much pressure on yourself early or other mental more than strategic or outlook kind of decisions that helped you through that first transition that you can apply to this one? Yeah, this transition is certainly a little less messy than, than the first time around. I think the biggest difference is I had been an assistant at Washington. I had some understanding of, of systems and, and even institutional knowledge. And so it took me a little while to find my own voice there. Um, here at Minnesota, I, I wasn't on par with the staff. So there's a lot of learning, but I come in ready to be myself a little bit faster than maybe it took me at Washington, I'd say. I know that Hugh is still on campus working in a role with the athletic department. How involved will he be? How much do you plan to bounce stuff off him as you go through year one? Yeah, as much as he'll let me. It, it's, it's a lonely biz, uh, job, you know, being a head coach. And if you haven't been there, it, it's, hard to, it's hard to relate. And so most of the coaches I would call are now in my league, you know, so uh, you can't call them for advice. But it's nice to have you down the hall to meet and, and share ideas with and, and share some concerns and, and, get, and really utilize him as a resource. I think we're tremendously lucky to have him in that role. Sure, you're well aware of that past decade and the graphic that we showed taking over a program that's never finished outside the top three, a perennial contender in both the championship race and to get back to the NCAA tournament. You never want to step in and put too much pressure or undue expectations on yourself. But what kind of expectations do you step into this program with in the back of your mind? Yeah, it's funny. If you've been coaching at this level for a long time, you you develop a healthy relationship with expectations. And the way that I do that is, I think words matter. And so we've got big aspirations. Expectations are pretty joyless, especially if you've sustained success. But So we've got big aspirations, both collectively and individually. And, and that's where we spend our time. Expectations are about what other people want. And, and aspirations are about what you're working towards. And, and so that's what we'll talk to our athletes about. 
There are some volleyball fans who are national volleyball fans. There are certainly some volleyball fans who are school-specific or conference-specific with more of their focus on the teams that play inside the Big Ten. How much of a difference? What are the similarities and differences between Pac-12 volleyball and Big Ten volleyball? Certainly both high level, both with storied traditions. Um, you know, I, I've been just amazed at the way the fans have shown up to matches on site. The attendance is not tremendously comparable. You know, I think um, the fans here in the Midwest are showing up and, and showing their support. And um, we had that at Washington, but, but collectively as a conference, maybe not quite as, as strong as what we're seeing in the Big Ten. So volleyball is on the way up and, and, and we want to be a part of that. And Minnesota is a place where it matters. Yeah, that's something I've talked to almost every coach about is the trend that volleyball is on, not just in terms of its popularity, but in terms of its visibility. How much more room do you think there is to grow a sport that most coaches believe is in the best place it's ever been? Yeah. It's hard to quantify uh, growth potential. You know, I think I've been amazed at just the last three years. Things have accelerated quickly, and it feels on par with what you saw from women's basketball a few years ago, as well as softball. We're learning some best practices for our sport, and I think you're about to see the result of some work behind the scenes, um, especially from coaches in this conference, who I think have been pushing to, to get this sport on the national stage. At what point did you feel like you had gotten a uh feel for what this roster looked like in terms of personality of the players, who the leaders of the team would be, who would be in charge of making sure the chemistry is where the coaching staff needs it to be? Yeah, pro probably April when you're going through matches and we've been at it for about three months is when I started to feel like I knew these athletes. But the most exciting thing is we add three or four more players to the roster and, and that and how that affects the group dynamic is something that's really exciting. There's just enough uncertainty to make it exciting, but not so much where, where I'm concerned. Yeah, among those uh, additions, OSU transfer Kylie Murr, and we've talked a lot about transfers and how impactful they will be inside the Big Ten with other coaches as they go from one Big Ten school to another. What does she specifically mean for maybe the things that you want to do and the things that this roster will be able to do with her as part of it? Yeah, it was, it was a must-get player our first week on the job, as you can imagine, quite an intense recruiting process. And um, I think she adds a level of competitiveness and, and, and fearlessness and, and competitive spirit that uh, will meld quickly with this team. And uh, I've certainly experienced being on the other side of the net from her, and I didn't want to do that again. So happy to have her on our side. For it's a good move, by yeah. the way. Yeah. Uh, we'll chat with your two student-athlete representatives, Melanie Schaffmaster and Taylor Landfair, here in just a bit. But I'd love to hear some thoughts on them from you before we do that. Let's start with Taylor, who's obviously coming off a phenomenal season. Yeah, it, amazing that you could have a Big Ten Player of the Year who the first thing you think about is how much better she can be. And, and um, I told her the gift that she's giving me is allowing her to, co to coach her. And elite athletes do that. They never turn down help. And uh, I'm excited to see the next levels of her game in terms of her serving and her blocking and her defense. She's already an elite receiver and attacker. And, uh, and so she's on a, a really exciting trajectory. And how about Melanie? Yeah, you know, you, you think you know a player from watching them on film and on television, and then you coach them, and they're totally different. And, and I think what I told people is Melanie Schaffmaster was the best surprise of the job. You know, I just, she was uh, really relatable and easy to work with from, from day one, and, and I'm really thankful that, that she's our setter. They like those comments over there. I think Taylor's giving Melanie high fives oh, no, about here. <laughs> that description. The great news is then I get to ask them about this oh, after geez. the break. Keegan Cook, welcome into the Big Ten. Best of luck in year one with the Gophers. Thanks much. Appreciate As it. Look at some key dates for the Minnesota Gophers coming up in the fall of 2023. Uh, Melanie Schaffmaster just mentioned it's only about, what, less than 30 days until that matchup against defending national champion Texas. Early Big Ten road trip to Nebraska. Another road trip to Wisconsin. That is that October 29th special Sunday Fox broadcast against Wisconsin. It is a terrific schedule for the Gophers, both non-conference and conference-wise. And in case you're wondering, Minneapolis has kind of become Big Ten Player of the Year Central. Three years in a row, six of the last eight. Stephanie Samini repeating in 20 and 21. Taylor Landfair taking home that award a year ago. And Taylor Landfair is with us alongside Melanie Shaftmaster, a couple of great representatives of Minnesota women's volleyball and Big Ten volleyball overall. Uh, welcome in. It's a transition year for you guys as Coach McCutcheon steps aside from coaching. Coach Cook now steps in. Uh, what are your initial impressions of what Coach Cook's personality is? I think he's really fiery, which I really appreciate because we need some, somebody that's really going to boost up our energy. And so I'm just really excited to learn more about 
his perspective of volleyball and just learn from all his wisdom that he's given us so far. Your initial impressions, Melanie? Yeah, definitely a little fiery. Mm -hmm. I think at the same time, though, he does have a calming effect for our group. When things start to get a little haywire, we definitely can look at him and it'll, it'll all be okay. We know it'll be okay. See, I, I'm a little, he seems so chill and mm -hmm. laid back up here. So you're telling me sometimes if things don't go exactly right on the floor, it gets a little bit different? It can, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I think he is still in the room. Everybody's <laughs> being really careful about, about the answers. There's playing time, all that stuff is still up for grabs. <laughs> Uh, how would you describe that transition? Anytime there's a transition from one coaching staff to another, there's not just a personality change. There is a change in the way that things are done. How has that transition taken place so far for you, Taylor? I think it's been really smooth, and I think that he's done a really good job of helping us smooth through that transition. And I think that he's just been very calm with us, really understanding and listens really, really well to what we have to say and just making sure that he's always on our side, which I really appreciate. Melanie, what about your role in helping that transition with the new players, whether mm -hmm. they be freshmen or, or yeah. transfers? That are kind of that are coming in it may be the first look for them but for everybody else it is a transition mm -hmm. so that chemistry can be a little bit complex yeah i think uh the beginning i really wanted to make sure i got to know keegan so i had the reassuring factor to be able to talk to everyone on our team because we did have a couple of freshmen come in in january and obviously they were just like asking a bunch of questions and i was like hey it's we're all going to be in it together it's been a smooth transition so far um, and I think once we got to know Keegan a few months down the road, it was very obvious how we all felt about it. Were you asking those same questions when you were a freshman? Does it take you back to your first year? Oh my gosh, a little, yeah. Just a little, yeah. Just a little. <laughs> uh, Taylor, for you coming off a Big Ten Player of the Year campaign a year ago, I know you have your own very high expectations for yourself. How do you balance that with not trying to put too much pressure on yourself because that label has been bestowed upon you last year? I think I just take it day by day and not really focus too much because I'm now in the present and I need to focus on what's ahead of me instead of kind of just thinking about the past and just kind of letting that control my life. Instead, just focus on what Kiki is telling me, continue my growth, continue to progress forward and just know what I have to do. Do athletes think about that less than we believe they do, those kind of awards, like when you get on the floor and start playing? Yeah, it kind of just gets out of my head. It's just a new game. I'm focusing on one point after the next and not really focusing on what I've done in the past because, I mean, I am really grateful for what I've done and all the things that I've completed thus far. But again, I'm still with my teammates and I'm still here for all of them and also my coaches. Melanie, as you start to look at the Big Ten mm -hmm. as a whole, you obviously know this league extremely well. You know what it takes to win at some of the toughest places on the road. How do you describe what getting through an entire Big Ten season feels like from the player's perspective? Yeah, from the player's perspective, at the beginning, I think we're all, it's a, it's a lot of fun. The whole entire season's a lot of fun, but being able to really understand that like we have to take it game by game, or even at some places when we're away, it's set by set or point by point, but it's a battle every single game. If we're going to Maryland on a, a Wednesday night, it's just going to be as hard as playing them as it would be going to Wisconsin at home on a Saturday night. Mm -hmm. So I think being able to like as our team having expectations, or not expectations, because Keegan said no. Aspirations. <laughs> aspirations. Not, aspirations, yeah. aspirations, not expectations. We all listen. Um, yeah, uh, I think having those in mind when, I mean, it's going to be tough and we might lose some games, but we might win some big games and knowing that we should probably treat them the same because we have another game coming up either the next day or we're getting on a plane and going somewhere else. So I think understanding it's game by game and we can't get too far ahead of ourselves. It was interesting to hear Keegan talk about the addition of Kylie Muir coming mm -hmm. from Ohio State and how nice it will be to not have to be on the other side yeah. of the net. From your perspective, Taylor and yeah, Melanie, I'd love you to weigh in on this as well. From a player's perspective, to have someone of that caliber who you've known as an opponent in the past to now be part of your team means what? It means everything. I just love that she's, she just brings so much energy to us and such a high boost of that adrenaline that we really need to kind of continue to go throughout the rest of the set and just going point by point. And she has a great personality, super funny. And I just I just have really enjoyed getting to know her and just be able to play with her in open gym and all that kind of thing. Yeah, uh, I was her teammate before we went to college, actually in club for like, uh, I don't even know, eight years. So I'm super, super happy she came to Minnesota. Um, she has a different energy. I don't think anyone on our team has ever played with in the past. And I think She's super bubbly and very social, and it's super easy for everyone. Everyone gets along well, and everyone knows she's here to win, and I think they have the faith in her to kind of lead the team a little bit, and I mean, everyone's super happy she's there. So with all that background, are you keeping some state secrets in your oh, up gosh. your sleeve just in case there are some times when you need to make <laughs> sure that they come out? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, as you start to think about what 
volleyball, not just Big Ten volleyball, but women's volleyball has become during your careers and mm-hmm. the change in popularity. I mentioned as we showed those key dates that you will play against Wisconsin on an NFL Sunday. It's the first time we've ever seen a national broadcast mm-hmm. on Fox. It'll be around a big time NFL game. Do you understand and kind of embrace how you've been part of this growth in this sport to the spot where, as almost every coach has told me, it's in the best place it's ever been? I think it's really cool just because a lot of women before us have not really had this opportunity. And so I think just being able to represent them, for one, but then also also getting to go upon this opportunity, I think it's been really cool. Yeah, I think what Taylor said for sure, and then I honestly, for us, when we're playing, um, we get to play at the PAV all the time, and it's a great community to play at. So I think, I don't think we really realize like how big of a deal it's become. And then we're sitting here listening to all these numbers, and it's like, oh my gosh, yeah. we got to play like in those games last year, or like Wisconsin was a part of Wisconsin, and Nebraska were a part of what they were a part of last year. And I think it's really cool for us to actually hear about it because when we're out there playing, we're just yeah. like having a good time. And then it's like, wow, we're actually doing something way bigger than ourselves at the same time. Mm-hmm. Probably an easier question to ask than it is for you to answer. What's the most impressive part of Taylor's game? All of it. <laughs> she'll just have it practice and I'll just be like, wow. Like she'll just hit the ball and it's just like, oh yeah, I'm just gonna approach and hit the ball. And then it's like on like the eight foot line and we're just like, okay, yeah, that's Taylor. I mean, other than that, she's a great human being to play with. She's super calm, enjoyable to be with outside of volleyball too. So. I mean, it's does it fun. ever put any extra pressure on you? Like, I, I need to make sure this ball needs to go exactly where it's going to go no, because if it does, no, I know where, I know really where she's thing. doing That's it. That's another really good thing about her is that it doesn't need to be perfect. And most of the time, it's like, I think it's me. And then she's like, no, it's me. And I'm like, no, we need yeah. to watch the film. It's yeah. definitely me. So it's definitely, no, none of the. Yeah. Good to know you guys play the It's Not You, It's Me game. Yeah. Yeah. Well, then I'll do the same thing to you then. What's the most impressive part of what Melanie does? I think she does a really good job of just making sure everybody stays calm during the game. And she's very calm, cool, and collected is what I would say she is. And also, she's an amazing person off the court. <laughs> I love hanging out with her. Like, she's definitely one of my best friends on the team. And just being able to get to know her throughout the years that we've been together has been really cool. And then, again, just seeing how she's developed thus far. She's, oh, she's done so, so good. She's very, very good. I love playing with her. And I hope everybody's family has, has a chance to watch. I understand you have three sisters. And, and at least one mm-hmm. is a college volleyball player yeah. and outside of UNC. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so how competitive was oh your house gosh. growing up with three sisters? Yeah, um, so the older two are about 10 years older than me, so we didn't really have to compete with them. I think they're the reason we got into volleyball, obviously. They both played AAU and all that. Um, Mabry, on the other hand, it's a good thing we're different <laughs> positions or else it would have been like a lot worse. But, I mean, we got to play high school together for three years. We played club together for a few years, and it was just a blessing. I didn't really realize until I got to, I got to come to Minnesota. So, I mean, it was competitive, but it was good because we weren't the same position. All right, Taylor, let's finish with this. Uh, what makes this year successful for you? Not necessarily in terms of numbers or awards or wins or how far you guys make a run. What makes it possible for you to look back on 2023 and say that year was a success? I think if I just continue to grow and just not set a limit for myself, I think just kind of just continuing to grow and to grow and to grow and then just making sure that I'm just still staying calm, staying humble because I haven't reached my peak yet and I don't think I'll reach it for a really long time. Reigning Big Ten Player of the Year, Taylor Landfair, Melanie Shaftmaster representing the Gophers. Thank you guys so much for being with us. Best of luck in 2023. Yeah, yeah, thank, thank you. you. Some key dates for the Iowa Hawkeyes coming up entering year two under Jim Barnes. Ten wins last season, the most since 2016. Now, there are nine newcomers on the 18-player roster. This has been a common theme throughout the Big Ten this year. Everybody has a lot of freshmen. Everybody has a lot of transfers, some from other Big Ten schools. Iowa certainly among that group as well. And with that in mind, welcome in the head coach of the Hawkeyes, Jim Barnes, to the studio. Coach, uh, thanks so much for being in. How has the experience been so far for you and your players? Uh, this is a blast. Big Ten's first class, really promoting our sport, and our players are loving it. So how long does it take a Lake Charles, Louisiana native who spent <laughs> his first nearly quarter century coaching at places like Lamar, in the South, nowhere really too close in the Midwest. Right. Uh, how long does it take you to acclimate, acclimate to the Midwest? You know, really quick, actually. You know, Iowa City, Iowa is almost an extension of the South. The people are super friendly, family-oriented. You know, spent a lot of time at Baylor where it was really hot, so I'm really enjoying uh, the mild summer. Um, but, yeah, we, we love it in Iowa. 
Wyoming, Tulane as well. You've been around this sport a long time. Heading into year 26, what do you still continue to learn as a volleyball coach? Uh, you learn every day or you get passed up. And, uh, and so I, it, every day the journey of just growing with our team and, uh, and learning how to win in the Big Ten. I, I think I draw a lot on being in the Big 12 and building a program all the way up through that. Uh, and so I've been able to serve my players really well in that regard, just knowing how, what I shouldn't do and what we should do. And, but the players are the key. They are definitely the key on getting the ship going in the right direction. So as you did that end-of-year self-scout that most coaches will do with their staffs, try to figure out what went right, what went wrong, what was your overall assessment of that year for you and your staff? Yeah, we're really proud of the team, the teamwork we, we generated on every game day. You saw a team put it all out there, all the way through the end of the game and through the end of the season. You know, we finished with two really good wins at the end because our team never quit fighting, never quit being good teammates, and uh, never kept – we just kept growing. Uh, so that's the big thing. You know, there was growth uh, for us and my staff. Again, just continuing to bring in more and more talent to help us get more of those W's. But we got the teamwork right, and we've got the culture right, and, uh, and that's where you need to go first. Yeah, you have an interesting roster because you're represented by, I think, 10 states, and you have a foreign player on the country as well. Mm -hmm. So what's the philosophy when it comes to recruiting and trying to get – the best players to come into a league where you know that every single weekend, no matter where you're going, you're going to be yeah. playing some of the nation's best. Yeah, we're going to go you know, everywhere to find the best players to help us. And for us, best players are the great teammates, and they work really hard. Uh, you know, you can, you can measure jump and all that, but you really got to look at it's rare to find a player who's disciplined. That's the rarity. We, you know, there's a lot of talent out there, but finding really disciplined players who are really good teammates. When you build a team full of that, you make each other better than the sum of its parts. And so uh, that's what we've been able to do in a short time, and I think we're going to see more and more growth. I'm sure it's easier, especially with as many teams as you've been around, to assess physical talent. Mm -hmm. You know who can run and jump, who can make really good swings, who can right. set the ball where it needs to be. What do you need to see when you're watching a team, whether they be practice habits, the way that they interact with each other, their mental approach to the game that lets you know that a particular group is ready to kind of take that next step? Right. It, you know, that's the easy part is evaluating the physical elements of it. Almost anyone can do it. Um, and so, honestly, what we get paid for is finding those, those special talents that players have and, a different, and how you put all those pieces together. And the special talent, again, is someone who's really disciplined in the way they work, the way they do things on and off the court, and really how they engage with their teammates. In our sport, there's no sport more needing of engagement within teammates. And so you can't have just really just individuals in our sport to really help your team prosper. To a degree you do. They have to be self-sufficient. Sure. But how they make each other better is really cool about our sport. Like Karch Cry, the best player that ever played, his teammates will say he made them better than they ever were. And so we, you know, we push ourselves as a staff and as players just to continue to make each other better. And that's what I love about the sport. What stood out to you as you kind of got acclimated to all the different road venues mm -hmm. in this league and how tough some of them are to play at and certainly tough to win at? Yeah, it was a blast. And I told every player when we would get to a new spot, half the team never been to these venues. I go, let's enjoy this. This is a, a, an honor to be in here, to be in this position. We're not walking in here with fear. We would look at the building and talk about it and talk about, you know, how the fans are going to be in here and in that Every volleyball player wished they were in this position. So we really embraced it, and every spot was a, a great you know, opportunity. And obviously, there's a home facility just off campus for you guys that is one of the newest, shiniest in the country. There's about 4,000 for the Nebraska match yeah. last year. Uh, what does Extreme do for you in terms of not just fan support, but as a recruiting tool and as a tool overall for your program? Yeah, it's, it's brand new. The whole area is brand new with the entertainment around it. And Iowans love to come to this area to, on weekends. And so they, they started flooding our games. And, you know, it's a beautiful venue. What I love is the Iowa fans. Uh, you know, we came and we played Wisconsin and we lose. We played really hard. And so the next game, I didn't know what to expect. We had more fans. And we played the team really good and we won a game. And just more fans, they, they enjoy seeing really strong teamwork in that fight uh, and so that's what's encouraging as we really start winning we're going to sell out the place there's no doubt every game 
Yeah, it's amazing, by the way, how much that area has grown. We started covering football games there in 2007. That river landing was nothing but basically right. one hotel. Right. And now it is a completely yeah. a complete entity unto its own. Yeah. Uh, the Fry Fest Invitational, the Hawkeye Invitational, you have Iowa State at home this year. So you get a stretch of seven matches over the course of, I believe it's nine days, mm -hmm. right in your backyard. Yeah. Uh, how much of a launching pad can that be and maybe how much of a launching pad does it have to be for you guys to kind of get where you want to be in 2023? Well, you described it well because that's what we want it. We want it to be home for an extended period of time and really grow as a team with so many newcomers and to do it in friendly, uh, you know, confines with our fans there. And Fry Fest was a great idea that to tie in through there from our great football coach legend who's, you know, to put a big festival. It'll be all around our, our game times. So we'll, we'll have a lot of fans come in that way. Uh, but it's going to be a great experience for our players because they, they love the Iowa fans. I mean, it, they're special, and that'll be seven matches that we really get to, I think, build support and, and build our team up through those times. Jim, as you specifically look at the roster and the players that you have and those who you expect to get significant time mm -hmm. this year based on what they did last year, in what areas do you feel comfortable and where do you feel like we got to get a little bit better in these specific areas for us to get where we want to be and to compete against this competition? inside the Big Ten? Well, honestly, I don't feel comfortable in any position. We, we got to get, get better in every area of the game. What, what we did well last year that we majorly improved in was the serve pass game. A number of coaches in our league you know, said that we, we improved in that area a great deal, which made us competitive in every set, is that we serve and pass really well, and I think we're continuing to get better there. Um, our defense and blocking is where we really got to get to the next level because that's what's going to give you consistent wins. You've got to play defense every day and block in particular. We play pretty good floor defense. Our blocking game's really got to step up, and it's something I take a lot of pride in coaching. So we put a lot of effort in getting our blocking game there. Jim, I'm excited to get to speak to your student-athlete representatives. Delaney McSweeney, Bailey Ortega are here. But before we chat with them, I'd love to hear a little bit from the coach's perspective about what they are like as people and as players. Let's start with Bailey. Bailey, you know, and Delaney, both Iowa girls, and uh, just born and bred, and it, it just oozes out of them their pride for Iowa and, uh, and representing our team and their state uh, and the work ethics off the charts. Their character's incredible, and they're fun. They're just a fun group of uh, players that really help lead this team. And they've turned the ship in the right direction, and they're going to steer it more and more as we go. Uh, you know, the state's really proud of these two. Yeah, how, how much does – a newer coach and a newer staff rely on players and leaders like that because you can't be around 24-7. Yeah, you know, and you learn it as you coach this game because before it, I thought it was coach-driven, and that's not the, the way. It, it is getting the players to not only be engaged but take ownership of what you're doing, and that's what they've done is taken ownership on our approach and how we treat each other, and so they show up every day the right way, and you see the progress every day because of what they're doing, not so much of what we're doing. Jim, without sharing too much that you don't maybe want opposition to hear, what sort of goals do you set for yourself or your team, not necessarily in terms of wins, losses, how, how deep you run, but the goals that you want this team to accomplish that at the end of the year you can look back and think, we did everything we needed to possibly do? Yeah, it, it's more process for me. We don't focus on results. You know, we, we talk about a little bit about that, but – it's that process that how we show up every day, how prepared are we, how fast do we start, how, many, how hard do we fight for points in the middle, and how strong do we finish at the end. Do we take care of every part of that process um, and the preparation for it all? Uh, those are the things that I'm focused on and I get our players to focus on. When they blow the whistle at the end, we look up and see the scoreboard and see if it was good enough. Uh, you know, we just measure ourselves by trying to be our best. Jim Barnes, head coach of the Iowa Hawkeyes. Coach? Yeah. The hashtag we use is B1G First Service. See some of the views from Big Ten Volleyball Media Day. Everybody's happy right now. Remember, everyone is undefeated for at least a couple of weeks. That probably won't be the case for much longer for everyone. Not in this league where it is a grind throughout each and every single match. Our focus continues on the Iowa Hawkeyes. We are excited to be joined by Delaney McSweeney and Bailey Ortega, who have sworn to me that the outfits were not planned pre-Chicago trip, but they were matching, Bailey says, on both the dinner on Tuesday night and today as well. But no planning, no pre-planning. This is all just school spirit. Yeah, school spirit. All just happened. Yep. All right. It's well done. Okay. Uh, as you start to look ahead to 2023, and Bailey, I'll start with you. We all set 
goals at the beginning of the year, whether they be individual, whether they be team oriented, whether they be number or stat specific or not for you, what are those goals? Um, I would say my goal is to just make sure that we're all really playing as a team. Um, as much as I want to focus on myself as a setter, uh, the only way that I play well is if my team plays well, my hitters do well. So just making sure that I'm really motivating them. And I think our goal is just to make sure that everyone feels confident going into this season. Being in the Big Ten is tough, as is. So making sure that my hitters feel confident, my passers feel confident. And if everyone's confident, we're going to be playing our A game. If a setter is relying on that, from you and from other hitters, I'm assuming that hitters are doing the exact same from setters. Yep, we rely on our setters. We rely on our passers, too. Really, the game is, that's the big part of volleyball. It's all teamwork. We all have to lean on one another to get the outcome that we individually want. For you, Delaney, the return to the program, you are an Iowa native, meant what for you in terms of what you wanted to accomplish and what you wanted to help this program become while you finish your college career in Iowa City? Yeah, it's been really exciting for me. I have enjoyed being in Iowa City. I love the University of Iowa, and I know that we're a team that has a lot of work to do. It's going to be an uphill battle, but I know that we have the 18 girls on the team that can do it and our four coaches that are going to help us get there. Bailey, what's the chemistry like? What's the, what's the dominant personality trait of this group? And I'm just going to guess here, after only having met you for a couple of minutes, that you're one of the dominant personalities in the group. I am, yeah. I, am, I, w- I would say that we're, we're very loud, we're energetic, but I also think we just we all have this desire and this passion to win and to see Iowa Volleyball succeed. And again, like Delaney said, it is an uphill battle, but I think we're all willing to go through the challenges of getting to the top of that hill. And you can see it, you can feel it when you're in the gym with us. So yeah, I think that everyone will see that when they come watch us play. They saw it last year and they're gonna see it even more this year. How how much do you, having been around this program for a few years, Mm -hmm. feel comfortable in saying that you are going to leave this program better than you found it when you came in as a freshman? Um. I feel pretty confident. I think that for me, my biggest thing is regardless of the volleyball score or wins and records, I just want to leave the program knowing that I did everything I could. I put in all the work I can, and I want my teammates to know that they're more than volleyball players. Our worth isn't tied to our score. It isn't tied to our record, and there's so much more to us, and I hope that that's what I can leave the program, that all my teammates feel confident in themselves in that realm. Delaney, it's interesting. I was talking with Coach Barnes kind of before we started our on-camera interview about the importance in this sport specifically about teams feeling connected and the chemistry uh, for you, what's the most important part of that as you get set to take the floor with your teammates before, as I said, each match that you know is going to be tough no matter who you're facing in this league? Yeah, I feel like it goes back further than right before the match. I think in order to be able to perform well with your teammates and everybody um, before the match, you got to be close with each other off the court. You have to have a level full of trust and respect with each other. And I think we've done a really good job building that. That was something that we focused on really hard in the spring and summer. Um, I think we're closer than ever. What was your experience like at the start of your college career at Wake and what you kind of take from that to apply to the finish of your career at Iowa? Yeah, I think um, Wake was good for development building. I think it helped me with my skills. I redshirted my freshman year. That helped me tremendously, even though I didn't see it when it started. But Um, I think it was a really good ramp up. There's really good competition in that conference as well that helped me prepare for this, but the Big Ten is just unlike anything. Now, Bailey, I understand you also have some outside of Iowa experience with the U.S. National Team Open program. What was that like? It was unreal. I love meeting people and I loved being there and all of the best players in the country all coming together, doing what we love. And I love learning from the coaches in the USA Volleyball Gym. Jim mentioned Karch Karai, like just the volleyball knowledge and just the love for the game that's in that gym is just unreal. And being in there is something that's hard to describe unless you're there. So I cherish every single minute I get in that USA Volleyball Gym. How impressive was the talent level and the skill that you got to see on display? And what were the biggest things that you took away from that experience? Wow, I mean, the the level's unreal, but for me, being in the Big Ten, some of those girls that we're playing, I, I see, yeah, I see every day. So it's also cool seeing the Big Ten like representation at the USA volleyball level, especially like in the 2020 Olympics. Mm-hmm. But I would say my biggest takeaway from that gym is just again, like the heart that they play with. It shows in the way they communicate with each other. It shows in the way they pursue the ball, shows in how they move on to the next point. I think that the heart of the game is so pure in that USA volleyball gym, and it's just again, it's such an amazing thing to experience. Delaney, talking about the experience of playing at home, what do you like the most about your home arena? Um, I think it just feels like a community. Our home arena isn't the biggest one in the conference. It's not the smallest either, but we always have it 
to the point where it feels filled. It goes all the way around. We don't have open sections. Um, I just love the way that it feels like a family in there. It feels like we're being supported completely. And I think it's really hard for other teams to come and play in our arena. All right, well, I'll, I'll flip it to you, Bailey. You take me on the road. What are your favorite road venues? And what do you think is the toughest place to play at? Ah, oh, favorite road venues. Um, I love playing at Wisconsin. I think that Wisconsin's fun. I feel like you can just feel the love of volleyball in the gym, even if you're the away team. Uh, I love playing at Northwestern. I love their gym. I love the purple. I love everything about it. Uh, a place that I, I have a love-hate relationship with is Nebraska. I love the love of volleyball oozing out of the fans, and it's so cool, all the sellouts they've had. But it's also tough to be an away team there with how loud it is, how energetic they are. So for sure, a love-hate relationship with Nebraska. All right, what about you, Delaney? Same question. Um, I really enjoy playing at Minnesota. Minnesota was my favorite place to play this year. I think it's hard to be an away team at Indiana. They have some insane fans that show out. It's very loud in there. But it's the same thing. There's just, like, such a big love for volleyball in the gyms, every gym that I've played in in this conference. All right, well, I'll finish with the stretch that I talked with Coach Barnes about. You guys have seven matches in nine days, basically right in your backyard. What a great start that is to your season. Yeah, I think it's going to be really exciting. Last year we weren't home until our last tournament of the year, so it's kind of hard to get on your feet when you're away for three weekends in a row. Uh, this year with that seven-game stretch, I think it is, um, it's going to be really exciting to just – Use that as momentum to go into conference uh, and into our last non-conference tournament. Nice for players, coaches, and families, I'm assuming. Oh, yeah, for both of us. I mean, being within an hour away from home, having families and extended families, friends, long family friends, having all of them be able to come for a seven-game home stretch is really exciting for us. Bailey Ortega, Delaney McSweeney, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you. It's not a long drive from Champaign to Chicago, but when you get here, you got to take the volleyball to all the different sites. You can see the Illinois Volleyball Social media team has t done exactly that. Some of the great sites in Chicago, and it's on Twitter as the Illini are now with us for 2023 Big Ten Volleyball Media Days. It is year seven under head coach Chris Thomas, finishing last season even up 15 and 15 overall, 10 and 10 in the Big Ten. The great news for Coach Thomas and company, nine players from that roster return to this year's squad. There is nothing to replace experience. And the head coach of the Illini is with us. Chris, welcome in. Uh, as I mentioned, kind of a short trip for you guys, but everybody seems to be enjoying these kind of days. How has the experience been it's, here at Media Days? It's been great. You know, last year, obviously, the first year. This year, uh, you know, matched that, if not exceeded it. Dinner last night was awesome with everyone there. And I think overall, the Big Ten, as competitive as we are, we're still pretty cordial with each other. And uh, we all respect one another. So really nice uh, event last night and happy to be here today to continue tradition, uh, a hopefully a longstanding one. With I think days. that will yeah. be the case for sure as the popularity of this sport continues to skyrocket. So let's start there before we dive too deep into your team. As you've been ar around this sport and most coaches have said that they believe this sport is in the best place that it's ever been, what's impressed you the most about the growth of women's volleyball, let's say over the last decade? Yeah, I just think overall, I mean, this is year seven here as a head coach and year 15 overall coaching. And I just see a tremendous growth in the game, not only from just the youth level and participation, but also in uh, being able to get matches on TV. And uh, I think we're going to set the record again this year with 55 matches or something, whatever I heard uh, the, the other night. And I just think it's just, you know, the more we can get in front of people and showcase what a great sport this is. Uh, it's fast, it's athletic, it's uh, very team oriented. I, I just think it's a great sport to get out in front of the masses and, and you're seeing big networks picking up our championship and so on and so forth. So I, I just think it's a great sport and, and just we get highlighted in a lot of different ways by the Big Ten and we're very thankful for that. How has the sport evolved and maybe how have the athletes changed over your 15 years of coaching? Uh, yeah, I just think you're getting better play overall, and the, the talent was maybe uh, in a, a couple areas for uh, you know maybe the previous couple decades, but now you're seeing a lot more regional talent, have a lot of pride in the region that they play for, Big Ten athletes. You're seeing, of course, athletes coming from different locations, too, that want to challenge themselves in, in different arenas, different environments. Um, and then I think just coaching all over the country is getting a lot better. So, you know, hats off to the high school coaches and to the club coaches out there for developing uh, these tremendous athletes that we get and to, you know, some really good volleyball players before they even show up on campus and um, you know, just a, a, a pleasure uh, you know, having them and, and being in the sport. But I think just overall the growth of the game, you're kind of seeing it across the country, not just within a conference play or collegiately. For you and your team, what are you most excited about for this coming season? 
Yeah, as you mentioned, we returned nine players. Uh, you know, we graduated a bit, but uh, we. But I think just the players that are coming back, uh, the personalities. Uh, it's a really fun group to be around. It's always a fun group, but I think this one specifically, they're very competitive in the gym. Uh, they're they're really, uh, you know, love one another and playing with each other on the court. They they gel really well, and so I think. You know, it's kind of always been a staple of ours to be kind of feisty and, and to be competitive. I think you're going to see that even more so this year and uh, just looking forward to it. How quickly does a coach identify what that personality, what kind of the dominant trait of a team chemistry wise is? I, you know, I just think it's, it's a general feel and every year you're going to have a different, you know, obviously we try to re- keep the culture and, and so on and so forth. But every year you're just going to see different personalities emerge and and uh, and and just come out as you kind of practice and go through your season. And, you know, you're about to talk to two of my players that, uh, you know, epitomize that really. And, and they're, they're going to tell you they're as competitive as ever too. And so, you know, something we try to identify, we recruit, we try to look at not only how they play on the court, but also how do they compete? How are they with their teammates? And I feel like we've, we've got as, as good a group as any since I've been here. So looking forward to it. How do you evaluate that, the, the compete level? It's a little bit easier, right, to see if somebody can jump out of the gym or if they have crazy velo on their swings. Sure. But the compete level is sometimes a little bit tougher to nail down. Yeah, I, I think so. I, yes and no. I think, you know, we, we spend a tremendous amount of time watching them uh, compete in either high school seasons or their club seasons. And, you know, for all the players out there who are watching this right now, it's not just about, like you said, how high you can jump and how hard you can hit. It's about how you interact with your coaches, your teammates. Uh, so on and so forth. That becomes an important thing because, as you know, every team in the conference is good. I'm sure every coach has come in here and talked about the, the prowess of the conference and how difficult it is to, to come by a win. And at the end of the day, if we don't have a good culture and don't compete well uh, as a unit, it's going to be really difficult to, to go through a whole season. And uh, everyone's going to have their highs and lows, and we have to be able to, to obviously celebrate the highs and get through the lows together and, and be able to compete every single time we step on the floor. Speaking of hitting, it was kind of a barometer for you guys last year. In nine matches, you hit 250 or better, and you were 9-0 and in those matches. That's obviously a nice number. How do you find that number more often on a more consistent basis? Again, I think it goes back to just you're going to face some teams that might have your number def- uh, defensively, and, and that's always the challenge. I think coaching is a little bit like a chess match where you're trying to figure out how to – uh, get players to positions where they feel comfortable for scoring. Uh, every coach hopefully talks about the serve and pass game. That's always going to help. Um, I think you know we have one of the better serving teams uh, we have for the last several years, so that helps on our end there. But also from the reception side, um, I got a tremendous setter in, in Brooke Mosier who's going to transition from being an outside to a, to a setter this year, and I got a tremendous hitter like Reyna who's going to come up here and talk to you as well. So that always helps to hit 250 or higher. But I think overall, just the, the talent that we have on the floor and, like I said, the chemistry that we're going to have, I think is going to help boost a few points uh, uh, just alone in that, in that regard. We will welcome those two student athletes in just a bit. Uh, before we do, what does Brooke mean to your team, both on and off the floor? Yeah, I, she's been great. And I've known Brooke since she was uh, maybe part of the old recruiting where we can recruit him in eighth grade. And I saw her way back when, and I, I walked up to her coach and I just said, hey, how long has she set? She's like, she's just set for like two weeks. I'm like, she's pretty good. And so I had her come to camp and she did a few things that she don't necessarily teach, but she just kind of knew how to do and, and uh, really responded well to the coaching. And so she committed back in eighth grade and now here she is, retro sophomore and uh, all grown up, and it's great to see her. But she's a versatile player. I mean, she's an amazing athlete. She's taught herself how to swing it left-handed. She can swing right-handed or left-handed. Uh, she's going to be pretty active at the net, and uh, she's just a great all-around player and competitor. Obviously, we've seen Reina's hitting ability. What else makes her special as a player and as a person? Um, the thing I'm most impressed about with Reina is, uh, you know, she's done a great job just overall, I think just developing into a great leader. And, you know, we had to, last year we kind of got the injury bug a little bit and uh, we was like, hey, Reina, I need you to pass half the court with you and, and Caroline. And that's not easy to do in our conference. We play some really tough, uh, you know, players and hey, oh, by the way, we're going to set you 50, 60 times and you need to handle that load too. And, and, you know, she did it with a lot of grace and it's not easy to do. 
um, just to, to handle that load all of a sudden. And there's you know been some ramp up to that, but when the time comes and the lights are on, she's as good as a competitor that I've coached, and uh, she continues to impress every single time. Not only in the in the competition gym, but also yep. when we practice and helping the team through summer workouts or being just a general leader on the team. So I'm very impressed with her development over the last several years. As a coach, how do you try to get teams ready to face what you have to face on the road in this league? There's, there's no other league like it where you have to go to places like Wisconsin and Purdue and Minnesota and Nebraska, go on and on and on. Uh, what do you see in a team that makes you know as a coach, okay, they're ready to handle not just a really good opponent, but a really tough environment? Yeah, I, I think that goes back to just the team chemistry and the mentality that the team has in those in those moments. And you can't shy away from any anyone or anything out there. And, and it's just about being uh, mentally resilient, really. And, and we talk, we try to normalize as best we can because it's going to happen often. And uh, the better uh, that we prepare them, obviously we're going to have our scouts and everything else. But we just talked to them about you know the challenge that this place might bring, or hey, here's how we're trying to do something different in this game. And it might be Raina's game on one game and another game. We might say, hey, uh, Kennedy or Kayla, you might be you know, the one that we're going to feed a lot of balls to. And then we just have to be able to respond in those tough environments. And so we just talked about being you know, great as competitors. And, and I felt like we've done that over the last several years. And again, just looking forward to, to what this team's going to bring to the conference this year. Coach, uh, we started by talking about the popularity of this sport. I'm curious, in your own house, I think you have three... <laughs> kids if, I, if I'm not mistaken has it uh, has it become a Thomas family tradition or is it still just Illinois volleyball as the uh, focus for now yeah, well I've I, none of my kids like volleyball right now so uh, isn't that funny yeah, how that works it is it is my son's an avid baseball player and uh, my daughter kind of attracted to uh, basketball my youngest maybe a little bit more in the arts and crafts right now but uh it's yeah, it's a, definitely a family affair. Got to hire uh, officially hire my wife as a as a third assistant this year, and she's coaches me for the last decade, so it's nothing new for us. But she's going to take on a bigger role with the team, and but as long as you know the biggest role is is being a great mom at home, which she is, and our kids have been fantastic uh, sports kids, if you will. And uh, this last year, my son went recruiting with me, uh, traveled how fun yeah two thousand miles in the car with me, and got some quality time with him. So yeah, we try to blend. Obviously, family as best we can, trying to be great both at home and, and with the team. And, and uh, it's, it's been a great ride so far. And Champaign's been good to us in Illinois. It's a phenomenal school and support network, uh, not just within the athletic department, but the whole school itself. It's, it's really an amazing place. All right, Coach, we'll finish with some video. You told us at the start how much you guys are kind of enjoying media days, and, and <laughs> you, you get the firsthand treatment. I mean, we call this putting you guys through the ringer. We're yeah. asking for digital. We're asking for every kind of interview yeah. you can possibly ask. Yeah, whatever you need. That's what we got. I mean, you know, I tell the team, you got to step up to whatever challenge. And, you know, they were asking me upstairs if I'm going to do the TikTok dance. Absolutely, I'm on the TikTok dance. Let's go. So I, I may it. not be good, but I'll, I'll be doing well, you it. Give so. it a shot, but <laughs> you right. don't know. You don't That's know right. until you try. That's right. Chris Thomas, great stuff. We appreciate it. Thank you, you very much. Appreciate it. All right, it. best of luck to you and the Illini in 2023. Not Coach Chris Thomas, Raina Terry, Brooke Mosier here in Chicago enjoying Big Ten Media Days. We asked the Illini to pull off some artwork as well while they're here at Big Ten Media Days. Not just snacking on the food, but actually doing some legitimate work and drawing the block eye. That, that's what Raina Terry came up with. We have, some, we have some serious critical evaluation from her teammate, Brooke Mosier, about to come. I'm not going to repeat exactly what you said, but you can if you want, assessing the art that Raina put together. No, Raina's was really good compared to mine. I don't know if they're going to show that, but Raina did a great <laughs> oh, job. Oh, I thought you were talking about hers. No. No. I was talking about my own. <laughs> okay. Well, I don't think we have video, so that's probably oh, a good that's thing. That's perfect. You're awesome. happy about that. Yes, I am. Well, you guys are a lot more worried about what you're doing on the volleyball court than you are in terms of artistic stuff and drawing block eyes. As you take yourself onto the floor, you look back at last year. Uh, what did you like about what you guys did last year? What do you think you have to do better to get where you want to be in 23? You know, I liked how we had a lot of fire last year. We did a lot of great things, and I think this year we mesh just a little bit better. We're, like, best friends with each other. We're living in the same apartments, and I think that's really going to bring us to the next level. Raina, how does that chemistry come about? You do have nine returning players. Three of those players, though, are redshirt freshmen. You also welcome a couple of true freshmen. So what is your role as one of the veterans and leaders on this team to kind of try to integrate everybody so they are on the same page? Yeah, you know, I just try my best to lead by example 
in practice every day and in the weight room and when we're doing our conditioning. You know, but they do a great job. Those freshmen that have come in, they've done a great job living up to those expectations that we hold for each other. So they've done a really good job. What are those expectations when you start to think about the way that you want to handle yourself kind of on a daily basis? Not necessarily expectations as far as wins and losses or stats, but the way that you want to approach each and every day in your position as an Illinois volleyball player. Yeah, that we come in and we compete as hard as we can every day. We give 100% of whatever it is that we have that day and that we take care of ourselves off the court too. Like we're getting enough sleep. Our nutrition is where it needs to be, you know. Those things are really important, especially when you get into season. Like you can't slack off on those things. So starting those habits now in the summer, they've done a great job at adapting to those expectations. I thought it was interesting to hear Chris Thomas up here saying, yeah, we're going to try something. If I'm here, I'm, I'm going to try it. Is that kind of the attitude that you guys have as well? Because if, if we're not going to try it, we're never going to know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think everybody's really willing to do whatever they want, like whatever Chris puts us at, and they work hard at everything. All right, you come off an all Big Ten freshman honor after your redshirt season. So there are obviously expectations that are there for you to improve upon what you did last year. And I know generally players have the highest expectations, even higher than those from the outside. How do you kind of manage that without putting extra pressure on yourself? Right. I think coming off of last season, I'm playing a different position than I will be this year. So I think the only thing I'm going to try to focus on is just kind of getting my leadership up. And that's really about it. What's the biggest part of that transition for you? I mean, there are not a lot of people that come in, redshirt freshman year, have a great year, and then are asked to change positions. So what's the biggest challenge for you? And what do you see as the biggest opportunity in that? I'll start with the opportunity. I think it's just a great opportunity for me to be able to lead this team and really get everyone on this, like, get on your horse and get going. And I think the biggest challenge really is just playing a different position. But it's definitely the position I'm a lot more comfortable with. It's the one I was recruited as. So I'm really excited to is it starting to set? Do you feel it's starting to settle in a little bit through spring yeah, and summer? Definitely. These past couple of days especially, we had a couple open gyms, like Monday, Tuesday, and they were really good and got me really excited. All right, Raina, what do you think about the transition that Brooke has made and how she's made it? Yeah, I think Brooke is doing a great job. She's worked really hard all spring and all summer on her connections, and I'm really confident in our connection that we've developed. It looks really good. I was never able to hit a shoot before uh, we started working on it, and it looks really good. So, yeah, she's doing a great job. All right, so for those that don't know what that term means, explain that. That is a faster tempo ball. So I'm more of a high ball hitter, but with Brooke stepping in, we've developed that connection to where I'm comfortable running a little faster now. So when things are going well as a hitter, when you're feeling completely, to use a wide ranging sports term, dialed in, in your game, what's that feel like? What does the ball look like? What do those sets look like for you? And what do you see when you see the defense when you're really locked into your game? Yeah, when I'm really locked in, I'm able to see the block, and the block is the thing that I like to use the most. You know, that's the first line of defense, but you, it can be used to your advantage as a hitter. So I try to see that and use that as much as I can, and I rely on my coaches and my teammates to tell me what's open in the back row, too. If the block isn't there, what I have open to hit, because obviously you don't want to hit right at the defender. So I rely on them a lot to see the back line of defense. So as you work on the chemistry that you guys were talking about, as a hitter, what's the key for the setter like what what do you want to see specifically on an in-system ball you want what and you know at what point that the ball is going to be where you want it to be yeah i mean we just work really hard on our connection and i trust brooke that she's going to get there so i have to 100 percent trust her which i do and i know that she'll get it there and i can't ever have a doubt that she won't get it there but for whatever reason if it's not there i just have to do my best to handle what i'm given I'd love to hear from both of you on your home gym because we asked a lot of other student athletes that were in here about one of their toughest or least favorite places to play at. And more than a couple answered, it's really tough to go down to Champaign and play at Illinois. What's the biggest home court advantage that you guys have? I'd say how loud it gets. It gets really, really loud in there. And it's also pretty hot and we're <laughs> used to it. So that's definitely an advantage. Yeah, a spike squad, they show up every single game and they are ready to go. Like they have our back 100% and they give the opponent a tough time. So that makes it really hard for them, but it makes it really fun for us. All right, I'll wrap with this then on the flip side. What's the toughest place for you guys to play outside of Champaign? 
I would say the toughest place for me to play is Nebraska. Uh, it's very loud, which I don't mind so much, but the fans are really nice. They just want to watch good yeah. volleyball. And I thrive when fans aren't so nice and they're heckling because I'm like, I want to show you, you know? But they don't say anything mean at Nebraska, so that makes it kind of hard. <laughs> What's the toughest place that you think to play? I'm going to go with Penn State. Their student section is insane. It takes up the whole court. But then also the fans are really loud, but the gym is also pretty big. So there's just a lot of space in there that it's echoing all over. Brooke Mosier, Raina Terry, thanks so much for being with us. Terrific representatives of the Lion-Eye women's volleyball, Big Ten volleyball overall. Wish you guys the best of success in 2023. Thank, Thank you. you.